A kindly looking old woman is carrying groceries into her home. When she closes the door, a crack forms in the wall and a tile slides down off her roof, crashing to the ground and shattering. The next day, the local builder seems confused. He just fixed a similar problem a week ago at another house, and another the week before that. He'll patch this crack just like he did before and repair the roof, but as he does so, he can't help but think he'll be at another house with the same problem soon. Old people are like this sometimes, though, breaking things on purpose to get someone to come visit them. Oh well, as long as the money is right, he'll keep doing the repairs. That evening, the old woman is in bed when she's woken up by something falling onto her face. A crack is opened in the ceiling right above her bed and plaster is falling on her. What is happening to this house? She would have to call the builder again in the morning and let him know that it was getting worse. She gets up to clean the plaster dust off her face, but stops halfway to the door. Was that a noise she heard? It sounded like it was coming from downstairs. Another noise. She definitely heard something. Is someone in her home? Hello? She cries out. Whoever you are, you better go. My husband is going to be home any moment, and he won't be happy. The noises seem to have stopped. Maybe she was imagining things. Who would rob a poor old woman after all? She didn't have anything worth taking. She still needs to wash the plaster off her face, though. She listens for a moment, and when she doesn't hear anything else, she opens the bedroom door and screams. The next day, a child stands in front of the house with a look of shock. Was there an earthquake? How could a house end up like this? They ring the doorbell, but there's no answer. They knock on the door and are surprised to find that the door is open. Grandma? The child cries into the quiet house. No response. The child enters and looks around. The house is a mess. Chunks of plaster have fallen off the walls and ceiling. Shelves have fallen over, spilling their contents. And there's broken glass from shattered light bulbs everywhere. The boy looks up the stairs and can see that his grandmother's bedroom door is open and the light is on. Grandma, are you up there? Still no response. The child nervously starts up the stairs, gripping the railing tight. They quietly make their way to the bedroom and step into the sliver of light coming from the cracked door. The child pushes the door open to find their grandmother on the floor. Only, it isn't their grandmother. Whatever this is looks like their grandmother, but like she has been stretched and twisted, her body bent at angles where no joints exist. The child is paralyzed with fear, unable to do anything but stare. But the nightmare isn't over yet, because their grandmother is still alive. Sadly, reports like these are all too common in this small town that is plagued by attacks from SCP-783, also known as the Crooked Man. SCP-783 is an extremely dangerous anomalous creature that is currently plaguing the population of Temby, a small rural village in Oxfordshire, England. Every 12 years during the fall and winter months, SCP-783 will engage in a period of hostile behavior that lasts for roughly 70 days, during which time it will target and attack people who are indoors and alone after sunset. Those targeted by SCP-783 will find that the building they are in rapidly deteriorates, causing damage and creating structural integrity issues. These often appear as cracks on the outside of the building that lead to the buildings taking on a crooked appearance. Unfortunately, while the SCP Foundation is aware of both the location and the periods within which SCP-783 operates, it has so far been unable to prevent any attacks. Additionally, the Foundation has yet to be able to produce either an image or even a physical description of SCP-783 due to the effect it has on recording equipment. Cameras set up to capture the anomaly produce only distorted or corrupted footage, leaving its appearance a mystery. Victims targeted by SCP-783 meet a fate that is, in many ways, worse than death. Their bodies will experience extreme deformations, as their bones suffer dozens of fractures and are stretched and twisted in various unnatural directions. They are then healed by the rapid generation of cartilage and the growth of extra skin to cover the new elongated limbs, leaving the victims a malformed knot of gnarled extremities. Some of the cases are quite severe, with one victim having just their forearm extended to over 2.4 meters and another who was left stretched to 12.5 meters in height. Despite the gruesome injuries suffered, 
the majority of victims are still alive following the attacks, though they will more often than not be left completely paralyzed in a persistent vegetative state, or both. 27 victims of SCP-783 are currently being held in a long-term care facility within a wing of a local hospital that was requisitioned by the Foundation specifically for the care and treatment of 783 victims. Like many of the anomalies that the SCP Foundation investigates and contains, many of the residents of Tembi appear to have some awareness of the Crooked Man, and the anomaly has become something of a local boogeyman. Researchers have even documented local schoolchildren singing a nursery rhyme that appears connected and may even explain the origins of the creature. It goes, There lived a crooked man who made a crooked deal. He kept a crooked cane and his catch in crooked creel. He stole a crooked child who cried a crooked squeal. And that crooked little man was broken on the wheel. A month before a recent SCP-783 period of activity was to begin, a Class D personnel, D-209, was sent to live in a Foundation-owned home in the village. Audio and video recording equipment was set up throughout the house in case the D-Class was targeted, in the hopes that some information could be gleaned should something take place. 43 days after he began living in the house, something finally did. One evening while in bed reading a book, D-209 heard noises on the ground floor of the home. Cameras on the first floor experienced corruption and showed only a distortion moving through the house. When D-209 attempted to leave the bedroom and escape the home, they immediately encountered SCP-783. During a period of time that lasted roughly five hours, their bones were broken numerous times and reset over and over, leaving D-209 a twisted mass of flesh and bone. Strangely, at the exact same time that D-209 was being attacked, all 27 of the living prior SCP-783 victims in the hospital experienced violent seizures, despite most of them having been declared functionally brain-dead and the rest being totally paralyzed. Also concurrent with the attack was a seismic event on the outskirts of town, and the details revealed by this event were both illuminating and extremely disturbing. Foundation personnel were dispatched to the site of the seismic activity to investigate and determine if it was connected to SCP-783 in any way. There, they found a small group of angry townspeople, perhaps frustrated by seemingly unending paranormal events in their town and the lack of progress that had been made to stop them. After a tense standoff, SCP Agent Collins fired her service weapon into the air, and the crowd quickly scattered. Now, free of distraction, the agents could begin their investigation in earnest. They immediately spotted several objects sticking out of the earth. Upon closer inspection, these were identified as elongated human toes. A dig team was sent to the site, and by the next day, a mass grave had been uncovered that was filled with the twisted mass of what appeared to be victims of SCP-783. Their mutated and drawn-out bodies were well-preserved despite being buried directly in the ground, and had all been buried head down, with their arms extending deeper into the burial pit. As one researcher was attempting to take a tissue sample from one of the bodies, the ground beneath him gave way and he fell into the pit. He landed on the tangled mass of limbs which shifted under his weight, and he disappeared into the pit beneath them. Agent Collins immediately found a length of rope, tied it to her waist, and climbed into the pit with instructions to the on-site team to pull her back up when she signaled. Agent Collins descended into the pit beneath the bodies, and after several minutes, she was extracted, though without the missing researcher. At debriefing, she described how she found an anomalous location under the ground beneath 783's victims' corpses, and she was so rattled by what she saw that she was granted a temporary leave of absence. The Foundation had to know more, and a D-Class personnel was quickly selected for exploration of the underground anomaly. D-2172 was equipped with audio and video recording equipment, along with several scientific measurement tools as well as a firearm, and was lowered down into the pit via crane. Their wired tether to the surface would both send the information they collected back as well as serve as their lifeline to the surface. As D-2172 was lowered past the mass of corpses into the darkness, they experienced a sense of vertigo before it was realized that the anomalous effects extended to gravity as well, which had become reversed, and that they would need to start climbing up in order to descend further into the pit. They soon climbed out of the hole surrounded by the reaching, extended arms of corpses and emerged into an open world with an overcast sky. It looked exactly like the town of Tembi, 
with the same buildings present there as in our world. The world appeared to be uninhabited, though, with no sign of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 began investigating the buildings and found them all to be empty as well, though they did unfortunately find signs of a struggle in one house, with what looked to be evidence of the missing researcher's demise. They continued exploring the area and found that the anomalous properties of the location extended to its borders too. And as the D-Class walked north out of the town, after several kilometers, they found that they were now somehow back at the southern edge of the town. D-2172 was ordered to return to the entry point, but as they walked, they were suddenly impeded by the deformed body of an SCP-783 victim that stretched across the road in front of them. D-2172 drew and fired their weapon at the entity, but it didn't react, and they were forced to retreat into the nearby woods. After several minutes, they stopped to rest when they spotted something else. In the distance, the D-Class saw what looked to be a giant white birch tree, and it was coming towards them. As the living tree approached, it became clear that it wasn't a tree at all. What looked like branches were extended bony fingers that it was using to walk. The long, branch-like fingers were coming out of the top of the tree, where D-2172 could see their origin. These branches were the elongated fingers of the missing SCP Foundation researcher. D-2172 turned to run as the giant living tree chased them back into the town, firing their weapon at the creature whenever they had the chance, but was unable to stop it. The visual feed was soon lost as the audio continued to broadcast the screams of D-2172. But this wasn't the end of the expedition. The on-site team was surprised to witness after several hours that the tether was pulled on twice, the signal that it should be reeled in. A medical team was sent to the site since it was assumed that D-2172 would need immediate care, and the team began reeling in the line. After several minutes, they spotted the harness that should have been strapped to D-2172, but with nothing in it. They continued to pull, but the harness became stuck on the mass of corpses in the pit. They then noticed that it wasn't actually stuck. There was a hand holding onto the harness for dear life. It was D-2172's hand. The team kept pulling as D-2172's arm kept stretching out of the pit to a length of over three meters. But eventually, the resistance became too much. D-2172 lost its grip, and it was seen sinking back into the mass of corpses inside the pit. Following this expedition, it was determined that only special operations teams and mobile task forces would be used to explore the dangerous anomalous location in the future. At least three such expeditions have been undertaken, though the details remain classified for the time being, and perhaps it is for the best if they remain so. The SCP Foundation will continue to monitor the town of Tembi in an attempt to learn more about SCP-783 and hopefully discover a means to contain it and its related phenomena. Due to the difficulty in containing the anomaly, it has been classified as Keter, and a local building adjacent to the Tembi Hospital has been requisitioned and designated as Provisional Site 5 in order to accommodate the increased Foundation presence. As the SCP Foundation continues to research this mysterious and highly dangerous anomaly, any victims of SCP-783 are to be retrieved, their injuries catalogued, and then their bodies are to be incinerated. A knife in the dark, bloody teeth and an appetite about to bring an end to one of history's most infamous monsters. The year is 1888, and the streets of London are teeming with tension and fear. In the daytime, people struggle to find work, fighting each other tooth and nail for scraps of opportunity. The sunlight only serves to illuminate the grime and misery, the workhouses and the factories, the smokestacks pumping poison into the sky. At night, though, it's even worse. The gas lamps provide only ghostly wisps of dim light, just enough to see a stranger's shadow from the corner of your eye, but not enough to see if the glint of something shiny in his hand is his pocket watch or his knife. You might glance over your shoulder for a closer look, but he's already disappeared into the fog if he was ever even there at all. These streets feel haunted even on the quietest of nights, but lately there are rumors swirling in the air of something far worse than a ghost skulking through the alleys. More real than the devil, more evil than any ordinary man, there's a killer on the prowl, and his name is Jack the Ripper. At first, most citizens refused to take notice of his presence, writing off his victims as women of ill repute, bound to meet a dreadful demise sooner or later. 
but as the bodies piled up, the sheer brutality of the killings became impossible to ignore. Now, everyone is on edge, particularly if their daily business takes them to London's east side, where the murders began. Once hoped to be a place of opportunity for those traveling to London from afar to seek their fortunes, Whitechapel has become a den of sin and terror. No one can breathe easy here, not until the Ripper is caught, if he ever is. There are theories, of course, accused noblemen, surgeons, butchers, and doctors. Whoever the culprit is, one thing is certain. He knows his way around a knife. Still, no one suspect seems to stick, and no one theory is compelling enough to lead to an arrest. Privately, behind locked doors where no policeman can hear them whispering, the people of Whitechapel are beginning to wonder whether the Ripper will ever be found. Perhaps this nightmare won't cease until the streets run red with blood. But even in the middle of hell on earth, day-to-day -day matters must still be attended to. So even as he worries for the lives of his customers and his own livelihood, the owner of a local pub posts a job listing, seeking a new cook. He doesn't need anything fancy, he can't pay for much, just a fellow who knows his way around a kitchen and can cook up decent enough food without accidentally slicing his fingers off. Still, he's not sure there's anyone out there who would be too happy to take a job so close to Jack the Ripper's domain at the moment. But the next day, as he comes in to unlock the doors and set up for the day, he finds an applicant waiting for him outside, grinning ear to ear. He's a massive fellow, towering over the pub owner at a height he's never seen before outside of a circus performer on stilts. But he greets the pub owner with a firm handshake and follows him inside, though he has to hunch a great deal to fit through the door. It's not as if there's a line of applicants out the door, so the pub owner goes ahead and hires him as the new cook. The cook is a Frenchman, but he won't hold it against him. That night, when the pub opens for business, the new cook gets right to work. From his disposition, one would never know he's working for pennies in a dingy pub in the most dangerous part of town. He bustles around the modest kitchen, chopping meat and singing in a warm, loud voice that carries through the whole building, bringing some much-needed cheer to the exhausted customers. Pretty soon, they get a taste of the new cook's work, mutton and potatoes and juicy meat pies. Whoever this new worker is, the crowd is pleased to have him around. The owner does advise the cook to stay in the kitchen, though. His food and his singing may be popular, but his appearance might frighten the already skittish regulars. There's plenty to be afraid of these days, no need to add a giant to the mix. When the pub closes up for the night, the owner stops for a moment to chat with his new cook. He can't help but be curious about the man where he came from, what brought him to London. The cook tells him, tearfully, that he was once a soldier in the French army, but that he lost his military career following a tragic accident he refused to disclose the details of. After that, he worked in a circus, then as a private chef in the home of a wealthy French family, until he was thrown out over a forbidden love affair with his boss's daughter. The pub owner isn't sure he believes a word of it, but he nods along just the same. He asks the cook when he first arrived in London, the 1st of April, he says, and with that, he heads off home, leaving the pub owner alone with his thoughts, the color draining from his face. April 1st was only two days before the first Jack the Ripper victim was discovered. It couldn't be. Could it? As the pub owner embarked on his journey home, he replayed the image of the cook's work that night over and over in his mind. The man was plenty competent with a knife, that was certain. He was strong enough to kill quickly, too. With those hands, he could squeeze the life out of someone before they even got the chance to scream. He could have done it. But why would he? He seemed like such a friendly man, odd though he was. And he was odd, almost frightening. He had clearly lied about his past as well. What reason would he have for doing that, if not to conceal a dark and terrible secret? The pub owner lies awake all night, horrific visions of his new cook keeping him from sleep. The next day, the pub owner's suspicions begin to fester and grow. He notices things he didn't pick up on before, the strange way the cook always speaks through his teeth, the deft way that he handles a butcher knife, slicing through the cuts of meat that he brings to the pub himself. What butcher is he going to? Where is he finding so much meat in such scarce times? The owner shudders at the possibilities. His customers are starting to take notice of his change in attitude, too. They see the sweat dotting his brow, his furtive glances toward the kitchen, and the way his hands shake when he brings them their plates of food. Several customers corner the owner and demand an explanation. These days, they can't let any unusual behavior go on for long. Something sinister could be afoot, after all. The pub owner relents and confesses his suspicions that his newly hired cook might be the Ripper himself. Not only that, but he's afraid the meat he's been preparing 
might not be sourced from any livestock, but from more of the Ripper's victims. It was an unwise choice to admit these fears to a group of men driven to the edge of reason by their own dread, bodies in the streets, and a bit too much ale. They swarm the kitchen to confront the cook and are shocked at the sight of the behemoth they find there. The cook greets them with his usual smile, but they aren't having any of it. They attack him in spite of his intimidating size, pummeling him with their fists. The cook tries to reason with the men, but they are determined to get an answer out of him, and his previously unfailing smile falters. He opens his mouth wide and in a truly shocking display, gobbles up one of the men in two quick bites. He spits out a shoe and it flies across the room, hitting another one of the men in the face. There is silence for a long moment, and then sheer pandemonium. The surviving men tear out of the pub, spilling into the streets in a drunken, panic-stricken mob. Wiping his mouth, the cook turns to see his boss, staring at him with wide eyes, frozen to the spot in fear. With a polite bow, the cook gives his resignation, apologizes for the disruption, and turns to see himself out. Meanwhile, the pub patrons are cornering a policeman, demanding he follows them to the location of a giant, man-eating monster who they believe to be the Ripper. The policeman laughs in their faces and advises them to head home and sleep off their drinks before they get themselves into any more trouble. With a full belly, but without a job, and without anywhere else to go, the cook ducks out the door to the pub and begins to stroll slowly down the dark, dingy streets. Up ahead, he sees a woman walking alone. She drops something on the ground, a small coin purse. She doesn't notice it fall and keeps walking. But the cook is very much a gentleman, in spite of his cannibalistic indiscretion before. He hurries over and bends to pick it up. When he looks back at the woman, he sees a man creeping up behind her. The shadowy man draws a knife and lifts his arm, preparing to strike. The cook cries out to warn the woman, and she turns, letting out a blood-curdling scream at the sight of both the would-be killer and the giant with blood still dripping from his chin. She picks up her skirts and runs as fast as she can, disappearing down a nearby alley and out of sight. The cook still holds her coin purse in his massive hand, but there's no way she'll come back to retrieve it now. The man with the knife turns on the cook with a roar of primal rage. He slashes at the giant with his knife, but it merely glances off of the enormous man's tough skin, not drawing so much as a single drop of blood. He tries again and again, but fails to make even a mark. Frustrated, exhausted, and still a little bit hungry, the giant grabs hold of the attempted killer, lifts him into the air, opens his mouth wide, and swallows him whole in a single gulp. The knife, still stained with the blood of his previous victims, clatters to the ground. The cook sighs and tucks the coin purse into his pocket. Then he continues on his way, walking out of London and on to the next chapter of his life's grand adventure. He has no idea that his climactic meal in Whitechapel was none other than the infamous Jack the Ripper, and the people of London will never know of the unintentional act of heroism he committed that day. They will only remember the fear and the sight of a giant devouring a man alive. But soon enough, that will fade from memory, replaced with relief when no new victims are found, and then replaced again with a mystery that will endure for hundreds of years. Though that cook was no ripper, he was also clearly no ordinary man. Before they decided to drive him out of town, the people of Whitechapel had, unbeknownst to them, been eating and drinking with SCP-082. SCP-082 is, according to his genetic makeup, a perfectly ordinary human. However, one look at SCP-082 makes it clear that he is far from ordinary. Some sort of external process has caused him to grow to an enormous size, standing at 8 feet tall and weighing around 700 pounds. Foundation researchers are divided in opinion over the exact cause of SCP-082's unique proportions. Some theorize that it is some sort of mutation, others propose an extreme hormone imbalance, some believe it to be chemical in nature, while others insist that only a supernatural force could be responsible for such a dramatic deviation from the norm. Whatever the case may be, SCP-082 is a formidable and visually impressive specimen. His head is bald and slightly pointed, his chin and jaw are large and round, his nose is bulbous, and his eyes are dark and sunken. His body has a high fat content, but also contains notable muscle mass, and his physical strength should not be discounted. 
His forearms have a circumference of around 28 inches, and his fists are nearly an entire foot across the knuckles. Suffice it to say, he is not the sort of opponent you would want to come up against in a fight, and certainly not someone to antagonize, though medical examinations of his body indicate that at least a few likely ill-fated individuals have tried over the years. His skin is covered with scars, and though his x-rays are difficult to read due to the density of muscle tissue, scans have indicated that there are dozens of bullets and several blades, from knives and swords alike, buried in the man's flesh. Clearly, SCP-082 has been through a great deal of hardship. But you wouldn't know it from his disposition. He is gregarious and polite, with a personality as big as the rest of him. Oh, that reminds me, I've been extremely rude. He has a name. It's Fernand. At least, that's what he says. Fernand speaks fluent French, but is proficient in English as well, though he speaks with a heavy accent. Whenever he does speak, he does so with a smile, talking through his tightly clenched and massive teeth. Occasionally, he clenches these teeth so hard that his gums will begin bleeding from the effort. The reason for this is unknown, but the SCP Foundation considers it normal behavior for Fernand, whatever that means. I have my own personal theory regarding Fernand's penchant for clenching his teeth, but I won't get into that just yet. Fernand does occasionally open his mouth all the way and separate his teeth, but only when he is eating or singing. He is quite the musical talent, serenading the SCP Foundation with his takes on well-known classical music, as well as long-forgotten drinking songs and the occasional sea shanty. He loves to sing while cooking, which he is permitted to do under strict Foundation supervision. He is allowed access to a rudimentary set of cooking implements whenever he prepares his food, including a butcher knife that he also uses to shave his unusually thick facial hair. He is given various ingredients to prepare on request, with the stipulation that these ingredients must not be too expensive or human in origin. In spite of his off-putting appearance and tendency to speak through his teeth, Fernand is easily one of the more likable anomalies contained by the Foundation. He doesn't express overt hostility like SCP-682, nor does he attempt to diagnose staff with any sort of pestilence like SCP-049. All he seemingly wants to do is cook, sing, and play dress-up. Did I mention his costume trunk yet? Well, he has one. Some of his favorite outfits include a tuxedo, complete with top hat and a monocle, a military uniform serves of the French Revolution, a ball gown that comes with an elegant fan and matching beaded purse, and a clown costume that includes a wig and a trick water-squirting flower in its pocket. New costume pieces are made on request in order to keep Fernand's morale high. According to my findings, in-house costumers are currently hard at work making Fernand a detective costume, a chef's hat, and a set of footy pajamas. Fernand is an indisputable charmer, greeting Foundation researchers with a wide smile, a joke, and more often than not, an invitation to join him for dinner. Unfortunately, those same staff members occasionally find themselves on the menu. In spite of all his endearing qualities, Fernand has the unfortunate habit of routinely snapping, giving in to his voracious appetite, and eating his visitors alive. He doesn't intend to do so, and frequently expresses regret at his poor manners. After all, having company for dinner doesn't mean you eat your company, but still he can't help himself, no matter how recent his latest meal was. Though I have yet to confirm this hypothesis, I believe this cannibalistic impulse to devour others may be the reason for Fernand's constant clenching of his teeth. Whether consciously or not, I think he is attempting to hold off on attacking for as long as he can, before he inevitably succumbs to the hunger once more. When his gums bleed, it could be a sign that one of his attacks is drawing near. Again, I have yet to confirm this, but it seems entirely possible. It's unlikely that Fernand will ever be able to verify this for himself, as his connection to the truth is tenuous at best. Though he is highly intelligent in terms of his memory, puzzle-solving skills, and grasp of language, Fernand struggles to differentiate between fact and fiction when consuming media. He assumes that any movie or television show he watches is depicting a real person, and that any book he reads is essentially a biography. This doesn't limit his enjoyment of this media. On the contrary, he gets a great deal of joy from watching films and reading books, particularly works of fiction revolving around Hannibal Lecter, who Fernand has described as his favorite person and someone he would very much like to meet one day. To make matters even more interesting, Fernand does understand the concept of lying. He's able to identify when someone is lying directly to him and also displays signs of being a compulsive liar himself, particularly when it comes to his personal history. 
Over the course of his containment, he is claimed to be a vampire, a homunculus, beloved Sesame Street character Big Bird, also beloved actor and wrestler Andre the Giant, Napoleon Bonaparte, French comic book character Obelix, the Foundation's own Dr. Bright, the Incredible Hulk, Alexander the Great, Captain Hook, and Detective Sherlock Holmes. He has also claimed, at different times and once on the same day, to be both Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. When called out directly on these lies, Fernand offers only this explanation. But I only lie when it's through my teeth. Which I have to admit, is pretty funny. SCP-082, Fernand, is currently contained in enlarged living quarters in armed biocontainment area 14. As he is unfazed by most standard weaponry, his cooperation has been ensured through deception rather than physical force. Fernand has been led to believe that he is acting King of France, placed in a secret palace for his own protection from potential assassins. Any personnel that interacts with Fernand must address him as if he were, in fact, the King of France, and any deviation from the charade is met with swift discipline. Any housekeeping done in 082's containment area must be performed by Class D personnel only, as it poses too much of a risk to non-disposable staff. Guards assigned to SCP-082's containment will receive Level 2 clearance but are not permitted to interact directly with SCP-082, no matter how friendly he is, no matter how many knock-knock jokes he tells them, and no matter how he tries to entice them into a round of karaoke. SCP-082 is a curious mix of congenial and threatening, the consummate host who loves to sing and cook for anyone willing to sit at his table. He's also strong enough to snap a spine in half, and has teeth that can crack open skulls, a skill that he demonstrates with stomach-churning regularity. Still, he seems to genuinely enjoy the company of others and has an earnest, playful spirit. From his giving spirit to his diet, SCP-082 really gives a new meaning to the word humanitarian. If you ever have the chance to meet him, just be careful not to let your guard all the way down, because there's a fine, fine line between being his dinner guest and being his dinner. What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on. Or you don't and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling, always beneath the surface, that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee. That quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, Why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to. Why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. 
The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? The guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think… I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good 15 minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and… The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure. The student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird, it'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist. Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. 
He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her, and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. But no. She just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it. Then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have, eight feet between them. Plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you, even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years, then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs, he isn't just being polite, he actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off, which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now, and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her, he actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining, he can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs, his world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something, a kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night, feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? But it's not just his lungs, it's his throat too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is… moving, wriggling and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. 
The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, this is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common house fly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you, just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known to Terra species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world it again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. A later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. 
Either the fly has some precognizant abilities, or is able to directly control events in the world. Or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Madbury simply asked, is there even a choice before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital? Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest to leave it alone. 10, 9, 8. A mysterious, happy-sounding voice is counting down as a young man runs across a rotating beam. He is cut and bruised, leaving a trail of blood behind him as he struggles to reach the finish line. 7, 6, 5. He hops onto the final platform. As a spinning saw blade comes buzzing out of the wall, he drops to the floor, moments before it takes off his head. Four, three, two. He stands up and sprints towards the end of this nightmare competition. The man leaps through the air, his arm outstretched towards the buzzer. One, zero, time's up. The announcer cries a split second before the man slaps the final buzzer. The lights go out, and the announcer's voice suddenly changes. It loses its clown-like quality and takes on a much more sinister tone. Looks like no winners this time. Now it's time for your punishment. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-024, also known as the Game Show of Death. SCP-024 is an abandoned soundstage which is a hangar-like structure that's normally used for the production of film and television projects. This specific soundstage has been abandoned for a number of years, though it's not known at this time if the anomalous properties it demonstrates had manifested before or after its abandonment. The anomalous location was first discovered by a group of teenagers who had illegally broken into the compound on which the soundstage is located. Only one of the teenagers who entered the soundstage returned and the report she made to local police detailing her experience was more than enough to tip off the SCP Foundation that something was amiss. The Foundation immediately began mobilizing agents, and once the site was secured, a number of test groups were sent into SCP-024 to learn more about what was happening inside. From those groups, we now know that upon entering SCP-024, visitors are greeted by an announcer who is so far yet to be seen or otherwise identified. The announcer communicates with the visitors via an intercom system, and will listen and respond back to visitors as well. The announcer refers to those who enter SCP-024 as contestants, and informs them that they will be participating in a game show with the opportunity to win fabulous prizes. The contestants are given fair warning, though, that the game will be extremely dangerous, and that only winners will be allowed to leave. At this point, the contestants are presented with the choice of whether to participate or not. Those who decline the offered terms are immediately expelled from SCP-024, and their re-entry is blocked by an invisible barrier. Those who choose to stay are then led further into the soundstage, to where they will participate in the actual game. The specific aesthetics and composition of the game changes with each new group of contestants, but the essence always remains the same a long and elaborate obstacle course that must be navigated through. The precise rules also vary, with some games only allowing for a single winner, while others encourage the players to work together and form teams. The obstacles can range from relatively easy and safe challenges to life-threatening tests of skill. As the contestants make their way through the unusual obstacle course, the announcer will continually talk to them, giving them updates on other contestants, advice on how to progress, adjusting rules on the fly, or even conversing with the contestant directly. As the game goes on, the obstacles become more and more deadly and difficult to overcome. This has led to the not-so-rare occurrence of there being no winners, with the entire pool of contestants having been killed or otherwise incapacitated by the various challenges. In these instances, the announcer will express his disappointment at there not being a winner, and SCP-024 appears to shut down, going dark until another group of contestants enter. Before beginning the game, 
The contestants are briefed on a number of rules, such as no assaulting the other contestants and no deliberate bypassing of obstacles. In the event that a rule is broken, the announcer will call out the offending contestant, and they are forcefully removed from the game by the studio guardians, who act as the physical enforcers of SCP-024's rules. The studio guardians can suddenly appear and disappear from anywhere inside SCP-024. Their exact look varies based on the theme of the obstacle course, but they always maintain a humanoid appearance, exhibit superhuman strength, and wear a mask or headgear that fully hides their face. Strangely, winners of the game have later reported that while inside the game, the studio guardians appear only as gigantic, shadowy figures that would engulf offending contestants and then disappear. Should one or more persons complete the obstacle course and abide by the rules that were set out by the announcer, they are declared to be the winner and the recipient of a grand prize. Prizes have included cash, electronics, cars, collectibles, and even fully paid vacations to a variety of cities and countries. The type of prize awarded seems to be completely random, and examination of the prizes collected has shown them all to be genuine, with no unusual characteristics or anomalous properties. Those who did not complete the obstacle course are announced to be losers, and the lights within SCP-024 are then switched off. The winners will find themselves outside the soundstage with their prize, while the losers are never seen or heard from again. Attempts to track where the losers go or what happens to them have all failed. GPS locator beacons placed on test groups lost their signals as soon as the game ended, and it is unknown whether this is because they were destroyed or because they were taken somewhere that blocked the signals. Perhaps the strangest aspect of SCP-024 is what happens after the game show has ended. Outside of the soundstage is a mailbox, and following the completion of a game, whether a winner was crowned or not, a VHS tape or DVD containing a recording of the entire game will appear. This is despite winners claiming to not see any cameras present while inside. Even more bizarre is the studio audience that can be seen on the recording watching the game and cheering on the contestants. Just like the cameras, winners have reported that there was no one present but the other contestants while they were inside SCP-024. The announcer also remains a mystery. During a test group which consisted solely of a Foundation researcher who conversed with the announcer, it became clear that it is both sentient and aware of events that take place in the outside world. As the researcher was the only contestant present, the announcer did not start the game and instead engaged in a conversation with the researcher. Most of the topics were centered around pop culture, and it's hypothesized that SCP-024's only means of learning about the outside world may be through television sources, though attempts to test this theory by cutting lines and removing satellite dishes from the soundstage roof have not shown to have an impact on what the announcer knows. When it became clear that the Foundation researcher would be the only contestant at that time, the announcer politely asked them to leave and recommended that they return with additional contestants at a later date. SCP-024's nature means that it can't be moved to a secure location, and it has been classified as Euclid. It has been determined that the best way to safely secure SCP-024 is to conceal its location. Five identical-looking sound stages have been built around it, and a security perimeter around the complex is maintained at all times. None of the security team members are told which is the real SCP-024, and to further prevent accidental entry, its entrance has been sealed by reinforced blast doors. Only D-Class personnel are now allowed to enter SCP-024 as test groups participating in the competition and Foundation researchers may only observe remotely. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter SCP-024 without prior approval from a Level 4 researcher will lead to immediate apprehension, and termination of the offender has been authorized. In the event that containment is breached, or if the true nature of SCP-024 is compromised, the entire complex is to be immediately destroyed by the specialized demolition charges that are placed throughout the containment area. A group of three Class D personnel approach the locked containment chamber. One of them is carrying a bucket and mop, but all three of them look jumpy and hesitant to move forward. An SCP Foundation guard walking behind them gives one of them a push forward with the barrel of his gun, and they continue stepping towards the cell door. All three of them nervously stare at the heavy locked metal door. Behind it, the sound of stone scraping against metal can be heard coming from inside. A second guard standing next to the door asks the three if they are ready. They don't answer, and the guard starts to laugh. They never are. 
the guard loudly announces that special containment procedures are beginning now. You know the rules. Two maintain eye contact at all times while the other cleans. If you have to blink, do it one eye at a time, and announce before you close even one eye so everyone knows. The guard turns and starts to enter a code into the keypad next to the door. Each of the D-classes take a couple hard, last blinks, taking the last opportunity they have to shut both of their eyes at the same time before they begin. With a loud hiss, the sealed chamber door unseals. All right, eyes up, the guard commands. The door opens to reveal a small, dimly lit chamber. There are no furnishings, and much of the metal floor and walls are covered in a reddish-brown substance. And there in the corner is what they've heard stories and rumors about. The thing that has given them nightmares ever since they learned that they would have to enter its containment chamber, SCP-173. Or as most of the staff in the SCP Foundation call it, the sculpture. It looks so unassuming in person. Just a crude, concrete figure with a stupid-looking spray-painted face, standing motionless in the corner. The three D-classes get another push from the guard behind them, and they enter the chamber. The two assigned to watch SCP-173 assume their position in the middle of the room, their eyes locked on the sculpture as the other starts cleaning the foul substance off the floor and walls. It smells terrible, like a mix of old blood and human waste. The two assigned to watch 173 pay no attention to the one cleaning, though. They follow protocol to a T, maintaining their vigil and announcing each time they are going to blink, even if it is only one eye. The third one continues cleaning, trying his best to keep his own eyes locked on the sculpture as he attempts to mop around it without getting too close. D-5933 does his job and doesn't break eye contact with SCP-173. Even though it hasn't moved, he can feel the presence of the sculpture, something within it, just waiting for him to slip up, to let his eyes avert for just one split second. They say that's all it takes. You stop looking for even an instant, and it's all over. With all of the fear coursing through his veins, it is hard to maintain focus. All he can think about is how dry his eyes feel, and blinking them one at a time never seems to be enough. He wants so badly to shut his eyes, to end their itchy, dry feeling. But he can't. Even with another watcher, it's too risky. There's suddenly a loud crack, but D-5933 doesn't move his eyes away from 173. He can see in his periphery that the other D-class dropped his broom and instinctively looked down at it. Luckily for him, there were others watching. D-5933 shifts in place, taking a step back and bumps into something. He can't look at what it is but he reaches behind him and feels that it's the other D-Class Watcher. But wait a minute, why is he facing the other way? What are you doing? What's going on? He asks, his eyes never leaving SCP-173. What are you talking about? The other D-Class asks back. You're facing the wrong way. I'm facing the wrong way? You're facing the wrong way. We're supposed to be watching 173. What are you looking at? I am looking at 173. What are you looking at? D-5933 doesn't know what's going on and starts to panic. The one cleaning is focused on his task, trying as hard as he can to quickly mop up an especially dirty corner of the cell. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It's the worst sound D-5933 could have heard. Achoo! <gasps> a sneeze, just inches behind his head, followed by the sound of bones being cracked, a scream that was cut off too short, and then a sick thud as a body dropped to the floor. D-5933 doesn't even have a chance to scream before a pair of concrete hands grab his neck and his own head is twisted around to see another identical-looking sculpture staring back at him. Ladies and gentlemen of the O5 Council, we have a problem. A senior researcher is giving a presentation to a group who remain largely in the shadows, obscuring both their identities as well as their reactions to his horrendous news. SCP-173, through means which we have not yet been able to determine, has multiplied. There's no reaction from any of the 13 figures seated around the large, curved table. The researcher in charge of SCP-173 waits for a response, anything at all. But after receiving none, he clears his throat and continues. We gave each of the new instances their own designation, SCP-173-1 and SCP-173-2. Two of the D-Class on observation duty during their regular cleaning of 173's cell were killed. The third was able to keep them both in his line of sight until they could be recontained and moved into separate cells. Again, no reaction from the shadows. But as you know, this wasn't the end of it. At some point, the instances of SCP-173 multiplied again, each splitting to form yet another instance. SCP-173-1 through 4 are all contained separately, 
but we don't know if or when another split will occur. The senior researcher waits, but no one on the O5 Council speaks or moves until the one seated in the very middle slides a piece of paper across the table in front of him. The senior researcher looks confused. He looks to the mobile task force guard stationed near the door, but he too remains expressionless, eyes locked straight ahead. The researcher, unsure of what else to do, steps away from the lectern and walks towards the table. He picks up the piece of paper and reads it. Object class, upgrade from Euclid to Keter. Orders, continue observation. The senior researcher nods in agreement, thanks the O5 Council for their time, and leaves the room. Lights flash and siren blare in the halls of Site-19. It's a containment breach. Facility staff, researchers, and site guards all run down the hall, screaming, trying desperately to get away. There's no hope for any of them, though. In a flash, SCP-173 instances appear behind them, snapping their necks and dropping them to the floor before moving on to their next victim. There must be dozens of them. Even as a guard tries to keep their eyes on one instance, preventing it from moving, another appears behind them. The staff of Site-19 flee for their lives, screaming for someone, anyone, to help them. The senior researcher presses pause on the video. The terrified face of the senior researcher who gave the last presentation is frozen on the screen. An instance of SCP-173 is directly behind them, its hands wrapped around his neck in the split second before his life was snuffed out. The new researcher giving the presentation looks considerably more frazzled than his predecessor. He explains to the O5 Council that following this horrific containment breach at Site-19, at least 61 instances of SCP-173 are now unaccounted for. It is still unknown how they are replicating, but worryingly, there is evidence that the process may be speeding up. He presses play on a new clip from the security footage, which shows what appears to be multiple instances of 173 working in tandem, some using their bodies to block exits, others creating choke points in the facility corridors. We have theorized that SCP-173, as we are now referring to the collective instances, may possess a form of hive intelligence. It also appears that this intelligence scales with the number of instances that are nearby. This allowed them to implement tactics that thwarted our containment efforts, as they used instances to block our containment teams from being able to pursue others. What you have in front of you is a proposal for revised special containment procedures. What I recommend may sound drastic, but it's what I truly believe is the only way to contain this threat. Each of the O5 Council members picks up the folder in front of them, bringing it into the shadows that obscure them. What I propose is that SCP-173 instances no longer be kept in containment cells, but instead placed inside of form-fitting metal containers. We can then use SCP-120 to transport the instances to the Foundation site on the lunar surface. The facility will have to be abandoned, of course. It's too risky to maintain a presence there, but each of the instances will be fitted with a tracking collar to ensure that we will be able to detect if any of them are somehow able to escape. The senior researcher waits. After a time, a paper is once again slid across the table. He approaches and picks it up. He sees that it is the same folder containing the revised Special Containment Procedures proposal. He opens it to find that it has been stamped, approved. Breaking news flashes across the screen. A worried-looking reporter appears as though she didn't have time to do her hair or makeup before rushing on air to deliver this special report. She explains that civilian deaths across North America are now estimated to be more than 500,000 people in the last 48 hours, as these still unidentified creatures continue their deadly rampage across the continents. It is unknown how many of them there may be, but the number of sightings has led some to estimate that there may be hundreds if not thousands or even tens of thousands of these living, neck-snapping sculptures. The reporter explains that rumors are circulating that the creature can be stopped by maintaining eye contact with it, but that this has yet to be confirmed. There is still no official word from the White House or from any members of Congress, and their current location and status are unknown, following reports that most of Washington, D.C. was overrun by the creatures earlier that day. The reporter suddenly stops speaking, and a terrified look comes over her face. Her eyes locked on something just off-screen. The camera pans over to show an instance of SCP-173 standing over a dead cameraman. There's a scream, and the camera goes back to the reporter, who now lies dead on her desk, her head twisted 180 degrees, before there's another sound of bones breaking and the feed goes dead. A woman in an SCP researcher coat sits at a computer terminal in a secure bunker, a large, jeweled medallion around her neck. Personal log of Dr. Bright. From the little news I've been able to gather, it sounds like SCP-173 has besieged and destroyed four Foundation facilities pretty much simultaneously in the last 24 hours. Each instance shows the same strength as the original, 
and thousands of them working together, are capable of ripping open concrete bunkers and compromising foot-thick steel doors. I alone have been killed 37 times in the last week. They can smell me, somehow, regardless of what body I'm in. The majority decision of the remaining O5s is that this is an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario unfolding, and they're gonna deal with the problem, or else the Russians are. They're evacuating this base, which means there won't be a single Foundation scientist anywhere in the New World. They say they're gonna try to evacuate the surviving civilians, but I doubt it. There can't be more than a couple hundred people in all of North America anyway. I managed to make it down to a secure bunker, but who knows how long it will be until they're able to get in. I don't think there's any chance I can get out either. I'm running out of food, and I'm not sure which will get me first. Hunger, the sculptures, or what I know the O5s will inevitably do. Dr. Bright closes the computer terminal and sits back in her chair. She looks up at the ceiling of the bunker where the sound of concrete scratching against metal can be heard through the thick walls. A sullen and tired-looking researcher steps out of a room in the makeshift foundation site that has been established just outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's holding a piece of paper and closes the door behind him, which has had O5 Council authorized entry only hastily painted on the outside. A small group of Foundation staff are waiting for him. They've gathered to hear what the Overseers have decided to do in the face of this world-ending disaster. The researcher looks around at his colleagues' faces, and as they make eye contact, any hope they had is quickly replaced by the bad news they know is coming. He begins to read. Revised Special Containment Procedures Containment Zone X-1, formerly North and South America, is to be denied access. Following saturation nuclear bombing, the number of SCP-173 instances has been reduced. All available Foundation resources are to be redirected to monitoring the ocean to ensure the integrity of Containment Zone X-1. Foundation adjuncts from National Navies are to perform around-the-clock patrols and sonar sweeps. Detected instances are to be contained and removed to SCP-120 for transport to the Lunar Containment Site. That's it? One of the staff members asks. That's it, the researcher replies. Several of those present <laughs> begin to cry. There's nothing more they can do. Their homes, their friends, their families, all of them are gone. Killed either by the neck-wrenching sculptures or in the heat of a nuclear blast. Why? Why did they have to do it? One of the other staff who appears to be a former site guard asks. That's all we could do, another argues. There's much disagreement in the small crowd. No matter how they feel, though, this was the official order from the O5 Council. Their word is law, especially in a world where all law and order outside of the Foundation has broken down. There really was no other option. All they can do now is hope that the sacrifice of two whole continents was enough to keep it contained, that SCP-173 is unable to cross the ocean to Europe, and that they remain safe on this side of the planet. The group grows quiet, mourning the loss of the world they once knew. When the silence is suddenly interrupted by someone running down the hall, it's another researcher, carrying his own piece of paper. He tries to push past the group towards the O5 Council's door, insisting that they let him through, that he has important news that can't wait. What is it? demands the group. We deserve to know. The group wrestles the paper away from the junior researcher, and it is passed through the group to the same man who read the revised special containment procedures. He quickly reads the report. It's just a couple of lines, and his face goes white. What is it? What does it say? comes a question from the crowd. A message from the North Atlantic Navy General Command. Verified sighting of SCP-173 in the United Kingdom. Nuclear bombardment authorized and executed. No survivors. SCP-173 has come for them. A young man tosses and turns in bed. He adjusts his pillow and tries sleeping on his back, his side, his stomach, but nothing works. He rolls over to check the time, 3 a.m. This is the third night in a row he hasn't been able to fall asleep. He feels tired. He wants to sleep. But every time he closes his eyes and sleep starts to creep in, something happens. And suddenly, he's wide awake again. It's as if someone keeps flipping a switch in his brain to awake, and there's nothing he can do to stop it. It's affecting everything in his life. He can't concentrate in class. His work performance goes down the drain. Even his hobbies become completely unenjoyable. All he wants to do is sleep. His friends and family can tell something is wrong. It's as if he has become a different person, and they urge him to go see a doctor. But the doctors tell him there's nothing they can do for him. He's perfectly healthy otherwise. He should try some natural remedies like valerian root and get more exercise. He has no idea how many days he's been awake now. Four, five, 
maybe more? At this point, the lack of sleep isn't even the worst part. It's the hallucinations. Sometimes they're just a shadow dancing outside of his vision, but others are incredibly vivid, feeling more real than his now dreary life does. He had to stop going to work and class entirely since he can't concentrate for more than a couple of seconds at a time. His friends don't want anything to do with him, and who can blame them? He has uncontrollable mood swings and lashes out for no reason. He's tried every sleep remedy there is. He took the doctor's advice and exercised as hard as he ever has. But with never being able to sleep, he has no energy left. He's becoming a living zombie. He gets up out of bed but loses his balance and collapses to the floor. He tries to get up, but he can't. He'll just lie there for a while. He starts to drift away, and he readies himself for the jolt that always wakes him back up. But this time, it doesn't come. The wave of sleep that starts to wash over him feels different this time, though. It's heavier, more peaceful, and more permanent. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-966, also known as Sleep Killer. SCP-966 is the designation that the SCP Foundation has given to a creature that belongs to a group of anomalous predatory beasts, standing 1.4 to 1.6 meters tall and weighing roughly 30 kilograms. These hairless humanoids have an elongated face, a mouth full of pointed needle-like teeth, and each of their hands has five razor-sharp claws that can be up to 20 centimeters in length. Though unlike humans and apes, they are digitigrade meaning that they walk using only their toes. But you won't be able to see the horrible visage of SCP-966 under normal circumstances, as they are only visible under very specific lighting conditions. They can only be viewed under light that has a wavelength between roughly 700 and 900 nanometers, which is just at the edge of the light spectrum that's visible to humans stretching into what's known as infrared light. The only exception to this is if their skin, muscles, or organs have suffered from second or third degree burns, in which case, the affected areas of their body will show up under a greater spectrum of wavelengths that are visible to the human eye. Though frightening to look at, SCP-966 are actually quite weak physically, with very low muscular density. Their bones are hollow, similar to birds, and while their claws may be incredibly sharp, they are also easily broken making them unsuited for use in combat. Additionally, they do not rest through sleep, but will, at seemingly random times, stop all movement and fall into a rest period that lasts roughly three to five minutes, after which they are able to resume their normal behavior. With all of these physical shortcomings, how did SCP-966 gain a reputation as such a fearsome hunter? The secret lies in their ability to emit bursts of a previously unknown type of wave, Hunting either alone or in pairs, SCP-966 uses this wave to inhibit its prey's ability to enter any of the restful sleep stages, and also stops the ability to micro-sleep. These waves have been observed to be effective at up to 20 meters, though tests have shown that they can be blocked by post-transition metals, of which lead appears to be especially effective. SCP-966 hunts and feeds on medium to large-sized animals, which includes humans and once their quarry has been targeted by the sleep-inhibiting waves, the effect is permanent, with no method having yet been discovered that will allow them to regain the ability to sleep. Experiments have shown that unconsciousness can be induced in other ways, such as with the use of general anesthesia, though these methods have ultimately proven to be ineffective, since although the victim is unconscious, they are still not receiving any of the restful benefits of sleep while in that state. The effects of sleep deprivation on humans, both mentally and physically, are devastating. Symptoms can begin setting in after just 24 hours that can include mood swings, memory issues, and sensory impairment. After two to three days, the body's hormones become deregulated, and bodily functions like hunger, thirst, and temperature fluctuate wildly as cognitive abilities start to dramatically decline. Hallucinations, paranoia, and fits of rage are common and the risk of death from sleep deprivation increases with each day that passes without sleep. And this is exactly what SCP-966 wants. After surreptitiously sending a burst of sleep deprivation waves at their victim, 
They will then stalk their prey until lack of sleep finally leads to total incapacitation, at which point SCP-966 consumes them. SCP-966 have proven to be both extremely quiet and agile when hunting. However, they have actually been observed intentionally making threatening noises around their prey, presumably to further increase their already elevated stress levels and potentially hastening their mental degradation. On rare occasions, they will even physically assault their victim to further degenerate their mental and physical health. Some of SCP-966's prey will experience especially intense hallucinations and bouts of rage, which is theorized to be caused by prolonged exposure to multiple instances of their sleep-stopping waves. Why some victims are exposed to multiple waves when a single instance has been shown to be 100% effective is unknown and it's hypothesized that they may only engage in this behavior when especially hungry, to try and speed up the process. Though others have put forth the theory that SCP-966 may take some perverse form of joy in seeing its victims suffer prior to expiring. Wild instances of SCP-966 have been found across the globe, and while the SCP Foundation has been successful in thinning their numbers, they still exist in high enough numbers to pose a serious threat to humanity. For these reasons, they have been assigned the classification Euclid. Mobile Task Forces IOTA-1 and IOTA-2, codenamed the Dream Hunters and Air Chasers respectively, are continually monitoring for any reports of sudden or violent deaths related to sleep deprivation in order to identify and neutralize the remaining instances of wild SCP-966. Four SCP-966 specimens, three males and one female, have been acquired by the Foundation and they are currently contained in a 10 by 10 meter room that is lined with lead and equipped with infrared security cameras. Each specimen is fed 20 kilograms of meat each month, and in the event that the female specimen gives birth, the new specimen is to be taken for observation and study before being disposed of prior to reaching maturity. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building, but incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time, though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They have explored a lot of strange abandoned places, but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell, but just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now, 
Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes, or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running, though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. But it's then that one of the explorers realizes he is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says, as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough, but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space. Gang signs, names, and street art, for example. But it appears to fade in and out, and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti, much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building, though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening, but those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building. Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness, before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. Their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition, 
No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping, and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. The bell rings but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming, and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist, recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams, and if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. A worker presses down on the plunger, and moments later, a huge explosion rocks the quarry. When the dust clears, the three quarry workers look on at the pile of rocks that they'll now spend the next days and weeks hauling out. But then, they spot something strange. There in the newly exposed rock face is an opening. The three men stand at the mouth of the previously hidden cave. They poke their heads inside but it's too dark to see much of anything, except for the fact that the tunnel in the rock stretches on for at least a few meters before it turns and prevents them from seeing any further. One of the quarry workers slaps his co-worker on the back and dares him to go inside and check it out. No way, he tells him as he pulls his hand back from feeling inside the cave wall, his palm now coated in a sickly slime. It's gross in there. The other two laugh at him. If they think they're so brave, why don't the two of them go check it out? The two men stop laughing and look at each other. Who could have ever foreseen the tables turning on them like this? But they're not going to back down. One of the two takes out a flashlight, and they step into the cave while the third waits outside. He watches as the two of them head deeper into the cave, disappearing behind the bend. Inside the cave, the floor is just like the walls, coated with some kind of substance making it wet, but also a little sticky. They half expected the cave to end right around the bend, but now they can see that it continues on. Not only is there another turn several meters ahead of them, but as they head deeper in, they find that there are branching paths too. This might just be the start of a vast cave system. There's no telling how far or how deep it might go. They better head back to the entrance before they get lost. The two turn around to start heading back towards the entrance. But wait, what was that? When they spin around, it sounded like there was a noise behind them. But there's nothing there, just the empty passageway. They must be hearing things. They really should get out of here quickly, though. Come on, let's go. 
As they turn to leave, though, something happens. With a sickening squishing sound, the walls of the tunnel constrict, closing up between them. He runs towards the now-closed passage and starts slapping at the moist, soft wall, but there's no response. But then he does hear something. Was that a scream? He's realized something else, too. Even though his friend had the flashlight, he can still see. While faint, the walls themselves seem to be producing a small amount of light. He yells out that he's going to get help and that his friend should hold tight and not move. He'll get him out of there. He has no idea if he can hear him, though. He starts to slowly make his way back the way he thinks they came, but the cave feels different. He's taking turns that he doesn't remember making on their short trip. He should be at the entrance already, and there seem to be more branching paths than there were before. It's hard to tell in the low light, though. Maybe he's just confused. He's hearing noises, too. Wet, writhing sounds. He's got to get out of here. The quarry worker reaches a fork in the tunnel and has no idea which is the right way to go. He doesn't remember this at all. He calls down the tunnel, but there's no answer to his cries. He hears more of those wet, slapping sounds behind him, though. He's got to keep moving. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The left tunnel it is. He goes down his chosen path, rounds a corner, and sees another fork. What is going on here? He's got to pick, though. Eeny, meeny, miny. He screams as something leaps out of the tunnel at him. Outside the cave, the quarry worker is growing nervous. He's gotten a flashlight of his own and shines it down the tunnel, but he can't see any more than they could before. He calls out, asking if they're all right, but he's met only with silence. He turns around behind him at the empty quarry. They're the only ones working on the site that day, and if they don't get back to work soon, there's going to be some angry questions about why they spent the day horsing around inside of a cave. As much as he hates the idea, he's got to go in there and get them out. He enters the cave and goes around the first bend. He too notices how oddly sticky and slimy every surface is, but he has to press on. Maybe they were hurt and needed his help. He rounds another bend and spots something, a pair of legs sticking out from around the next turn. His friend must really have been hurt. He runs towards his injured co-worker and kneels down next to him. It looks like he's passed out on the ground and he tries to shake him awake. Are you okay? What happened? His friend moans a bit, but doesn't even open his eyes. He moans again, and this time blood starts pouring out of his mouth. The quarry worker steps back, scared at the sight of his friend's state. That's when he notices something. His friend's stomach. It's moving. He leans in close. He can see bumps swelling and moving around his abdomen. Is that? The SCP Foundation soon learned of the troubling reports and moved quickly to purchase the quarry and the surrounding lands. Those who had seen or heard rumors about the missing workers were amnestitized, and all further access to the area around the quarry was strictly controlled. The cave itself that had been unearthed was designated SCP-2385, but the Foundation needed to learn just what they were dealing with. So after a research outpost was constructed over the entrance, the investigation into what was happening inside this strange anomalous cavern system could finally begin. The first to enter the cave is D-11424, a Class D personnel, who is equipped with a shoulder-mounted camera, a Ruger LC-9 pistol, a machete, and one week's worth of rations, since it was unknown just how vast this cave system may be. D-11424 proceeds into the cave and immediately reports back the same conditions that the workers had experienced, that the surfaces of the cave were soft, wet, and a little sticky, and also that they seemed to have an almost imperceptible glow. D-11424 moves deeper into the cave, but sees no sign of the missing workers, despite one of their bodies having been reported as being lost relatively close to the entrance. He's ordered to continue deeper into the cave, and radios back that the walls weren't stable. He would pass by openings in the walls that would seal off once he was passed. On more than one occasion, he saw new passages open up as well, and these didn't appear to be caused by collapses or other geological activity. The walls seemed like they were alive. But the walls were the only sign of life he could find. There was still no evidence of the missing workers or whatever might have gotten them. But then, after D-11424 rounds a corner, he sees that something is up ahead of him. It's not one of the workers. It's a creature, and one that looks like nothing he has ever seen before. The thing crawling on the floor of the cave looks like a giant worm, several feet in length, but with a grotesque, skinless human head. D-11424, frightened at the sight of this grotesque creature, turns to run, but it's too late. 
The worm has spotted him and charges at him immediately, slithering across the wet cave floor at an incredible speed. D-11424 slips and falls to the ground. His shoulder-mounted camera knocked off his body and left facing a wall, leaving the researchers monitoring the feed with nothing except the sound of his screams. Once contact was lost with the Class D personnel, the Foundation decided that due to the presence of hostile creatures within the cave system, that the next exploratory expedition would be undertaken without humans. The mission was authorized, and two months later, a remote-controlled drone designated A-47 was sent into the cave. Just like D-11424 and the quarry workers before saw, its camera captures passageways opening and closing in the living rock walls. As it progresses deeper, it eventually spots the same worm-like creatures with horrible human faces that look like they've had their skin removed, which have now been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2385-1 entities. And A-47 soon discovers a surprising fact about these bizarre organisms. They appear that they are being birthed right from the walls of the cave itself. As A-47 enters one of those largest rooms yet seen in the cave, its camera captures over a dozen 2385-1s growing out of the walls and ceiling in various stages of maturity. Some of them snap at A-47 as it passes by, trying to attack the drone, but luckily they're unable to reach. There's larger examples of the worms in the room too, and these ones also differ in appearance slightly, with a fibrous growth over their eyes. The researchers assume that these entities are different enough from the smaller versions that they warrant their own classification and are designated as SCP-2385-2 entities. Luckily for A-47, these larger specimens, which can be as large as 4 meters in length, seem much more docile than their smaller counterparts and ignore A-47 as it passes by. A-47 then learns another shocking piece of information about these disturbing worm-like creatures. They're cannibalistic. Its camera relays footage back to the research team of a 2385-1 entity feeding on another, smaller one. It appears that they eat their prey whole after unhinging their grotesque jaws. The one feeding tries to lash out at A-47 with its tail, but can't reach him with half of another instance in its mouth, and the drone continues deeper into the cave. Just when A-47 enters the next chamber, a 2385-1 instance growing out of the ceiling drops down right in front of it, leaving no way for the drone to get around it in the narrow section of cave. A-47 quickly turns around to seek out another path, but its camera captures the passage closing in front of it. A-47 is trapped. The 2385-1 entity charges towards the remote-controlled drone and attacks, biting and slapping it with its powerful tail. It then attempts to consume it, but is unable to ingest the bulky drone and, instead, leaves the heavily damaged robot for dead, slithering away deeper into the cave. The battered drone lies immobile on the cave floor for several hours, its camera broadcasting until the last of its battery is finally about to run out. Just before it stops sending signals back to the research outpost, though, it captures something. The wall next to A-47 opens up, and two of the larger SCP-2385-2 entities emerge from the new passageway. One of them approaches A-47, as the other probes at the wall next to it with its head. It seems as though the larger of the entities are actually able to form new pathways in the cave, or at least open up doorways between existing ones. With the last of its battery power, A-47 sends back a truly remarkable sight. Out of the hole opened by the 2385-2 entity appears D-11424. He's dirty, disheveled, sporting a month's worth of beard growth, and brandishing a machete. The wall opens up from the Dash-2 entity prodding at it, and the odd group exits through it. It's the last thing A-47 transmits back to the Foundation. Two months later, after several more failed manned missions, there was finally a success. An SCP-2385-2 instance that had wandered close to the entrance was retrieved from the cave system and brought back to a Foundation research site where a camera was surgically implanted in its head. The entity, which was designated as Subject Alpha, or SA, was then amnestitized and released back into the 2385 caves, allowing researchers to monitor how it behaved as it traveled through its home environment. The researchers watched as SA made its way through the cave system and stopped in another of the rooms filled with young versions of 2385-1. The larger entity approached several and appeared to nuzzle its face against theirs before moving on, which looked to have a calming effect on the extremely aggressive smaller versions. As it continues through the tunnels, SA sees a group of 2385-1 instances feeding on a deceased 2385-2. 
It appears that when 2385-1s are unable to swallow their prey whole, they burrow into the body and consume them from the inside out. Luckily, they are too distracted by their meal to pay any attention to SA, and it is able to pass by. SA then runs into two other 2385-2 entities, and the three begin traveling through the caves together. They are soon attacked by a smaller Dash-1, but the group is able to pin the biting and thrashing entity to the ground with their powerful tails, allowing SA to nuzzle it. Just like with the ones being birthed from the wall, this seems to calm the creature, but there is another effect as well. As the 2385-1 entity becomes more docile, the same fibrous growths that can be seen on the larger 2385-2 entities start to grow over its eyes. Is this how 2385-2s are created? The group of Dash 2s continues their journey through the tunnels, often stopping to prod at the walls to open new pathways. It appears that they are searching for something, looking around each new room they enter before moving on. Eventually, they run into something, but it doesn't appear to be what they wanted to find. They enter a new section of cave, and blocking the path in front of them is the largest SCP-2385-1 entity yet recorded. It's as big as the Dash 2s at over 7 meters in length and weighing an estimated 400 kilograms. It appears to be extremely hostile, but the Dash 2s seem to instinctively know that the only way forward is to go past this massive Dash 1. The trio nuzzles their heads together as if they are saying one final goodbye before one of the Dash 2s charges straight ahead. The Dash 1 attacks and quickly incapacitates it with its powerful tail and snapping jaws. It begins feeding on the Dash 2, giving SA and its one remaining companion the time they need to get past. As the now duo moves past, the other is attacked from a side tunnel by a group of regular-sized but ferocious Dash 1s. SA can't do anything to help. It seems to pick up the pace and continues on, but as it rounds a corner, it comes face to face with another large Dash 1 instance. It turns down a side tunnel to avoid it, but finds itself in a dead end. It prods at the wall as the Dash 1 rushes towards it, but no new passageways open. It turns around, seemingly resigned to its fate as the Dash 1 begins attacking. But just then, something else appears in the tunnel coming towards them. It's D-11424, charging forward with his machete raised in the air, his hair and beard both long and wild. He begins fighting the large Dash 1 entity, hacking at it with his machete until it finally dies. With the vicious entity now dead, he kneels down next to S.A. and begins stroking its head in a calming manner. Hey there, little guy. You all right? He asks as he pets the 2385-2. Yeah, you're fine. Get up. I know where it is. Come with me. S.A. struggles from its injuries, but is able to follow D-11424 as he leads it through the tunnels. With D-11424 stopping at one point to carve a piece off of the fleshy walls and consume it. The tunnels eventually open up into a large room that looks similar to the rest of the cave system, except there is a huge glowing orb at its center. It's a beautiful sphere of warm light that appears to be at least 10 meters in diameter. Here we are, the D-Class tells S.A. and motions towards the orb. It's all right. S.A. nuzzles against D-11424, perhaps one final thank you for saving its life, then instinctually seems to know what to do. The camera feed shows that it began crawling towards the sphere, and after a brief pause, started pushing itself inside. The camera recorded the brilliant light of the orb engulfing S.A. and its implanted camera before the feed finally cut out. The SCP Foundation would later discover that on that very same day, in the city of Elgin, Illinois, a local woman was admitted to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pains. Doctors performed emergency surgery and found something they did not expect. A micro camera had somehow become embedded inside of her body, which upon later investigations would be found to bear the same serial number as the one that had been implanted in SA. Following this strange event, SCP-2385, which had previously been classified as Euclid, was upgraded to Keter. An observation site has been built at the quarry and no further human expeditions are allowed inside. In a bit of good news, sometime later, D-11424 finally emerged from the cave system. He was taken back into SCP Foundation custody and continues engaging in exploratory missions on behalf of the Foundation to this day. There are no streetlights on this stretch of the old, narrow road which runs through a rural part of West Virginia. A car has gone off the road into a ditch and needs to be pulled out, a common task for this tow truck driver, and he's often in the area doing similar jobs, though he's never been on this particular road, and he has to keep his eyes peeled for any signs or other markers that might give him an idea of how close he is to his turn. He spots something up ahead, but as he gets closer, he sees that it isn't a road sign, it's a billboard. As he passes by, 
You can make out the weathered lettering advertising a diner 20 miles down the road that's probably been closed for at least as many years. As he continues driving, he sees more dilapidated billboards, advertising other long-since shuttered businesses like gas stations and auto body shops. But then he sees one on the road ahead of him that's nothing like the others. This one doesn't look old at all. In fact, it looks quite new. He drives by and has to question if he saw it correctly. It seemed like all it said was, get away, over and over, and then the name of a road. Is that an invitation or a warning? It wasn't even clear what kind of business it might be advertising. He continues driving, but he can't quit thinking about that strange sign. He even feels compelled to turn around so he can get another look at it. But there's no need, because as he rounds a curve, there's another of the same sign. This time he slows down as he passes to get a better look, and he was right. It just says, get away multiple times with the name of a road. Wagriwa Road. Must be Native American or something. Now he really can't get the billboard out of his mind. What does it mean? What is it advertising? And why is there a third one of them just ahead of him? He pulls his truck to the side of the road, stopping with his headlights illuminating the sign. He gets out of the truck and stands in front of the billboard. It's just the same as the others. Get away, written over and over. Wagriwa Road. He can see now that the background of the sign is a picture of some trees on a gray, cloudy winter day. He also notices for the first time that there's another line at the bottom. Find what you are looking for. What does it mean? Find what you're looking for on Wagriwa Road? Where even is that? There's no directions, no address, no phone number. He takes a step back from the sign and looks up and down the darkened road. What is he doing out here on the side of the road? Someone is stranded in a ditch waiting for him and he's staring at a billboard? He gets back into the truck, puts it in gear, and drives away. As he continues down the tree-lined rural road, though, he inevitably finds his thoughts turning back to the signs. Get away. But find what you're looking for? Doesn't make any sense. Or are you supposed to get away to Wagriwa Road? Who would put these up? And why do they look so new? Everything else out here looks like it's for a business that shut down years ago. What are they trying to- <gasps> He suddenly slams on his brakes and comes to a screeching stop in the middle of the road. His eyes are locked on what's in front of him. His headlights aren't lighting up another billboard, though. This time, it is a worn road sign. Wagriwa Road. He can't help it. He has to know what's down this road. He has to know what these signs are about. The stuck driver can wait a few minutes longer. He turns his truck onto the narrow gravel road and drives for a few hundred yards, following it around a couple of bends as it winds through the trees until it abruptly ends. There's nothing out here. No buildings, no signs just what looks to be a dirt path leading deeper into the woods. The tow truck driver switches off the ignition, and the road is plunged into darkness. He reaches under his seat and takes out a flashlight before getting out of the truck. He shines the light into the woods surrounding him, but there's nothing to see. No, wait. There is something, and it's coming down the path out of the trees. Phil? Phil, is that you? The figure that stepped out of the woods is talking to him. He shines his flashlight at them, and they raise a hand to shade their eyes from the light. Sharon, what are you doing out here? It's Sharon, the tow truck driver's ex-wife, but he thought she'd moved to Colorado after she remarried. Why would she be here? And what was she doing emerging from the woods? Phil, come here. I need to show you something. He hesitates for just a moment, but then finds that he's walking towards his ex-wife. Before he can reach her, she turns around and starts walking down the path back into the woods, and he follows. He walks just behind her, his flashlight illuminating the path in front of them. He thinks he hears a rustling coming from the woods next to him and searches the trees with his flashlight, but doesn't see anything. Come on, it's just a little further, she says. Where are we going? What's just a little further? What you're looking for. The woods suddenly open up, and he finds that they are standing in a clearing. She stops walking, and he pauses next to her. He opens his mouth to speak, but she quickly shushes him. Quiet, they're almost here. The tow truck driver looks around, but he doesn't see anything, just the faint outline of trees that are barely visible on this moonless night. But then he watches as several creatures begin to emerge out of the woods into the clearing. They're… deer? He watches as just a few come towards him at first, but then he notices that they have completely surrounded him. There must be over twenty. Turn off your light, she tells him. He obeys, and in the darkness he can see now that there is something special about these deer. Their eyes are glowing with a pale white light. One of the smaller deer steps forward and cautiously approaches him. He squats down and holds his hand out, showing it that he means it no harm. The deer looks back nervously at a larger one that he thinks must be its mother. It looks like it nods in approval, and the smaller deer moves closer, 
He can clearly see its big, beautiful doe eyes glow brightly in the dark. You're okay, he says, and leans forward to give it a reassuring pet when... Following the mysterious disappearances of multiple people in an area of West Virginia near the town of Harper's Ferry, the SCP Foundation soon became interested in a particular stretch of road where it appeared that many of those who had gone missing had traveled just prior to their vanishing. Agents were dispatched to the area and immediately detected high levels of thaumaturgic energy, with the epicenter appearing to be on a plot of privately owned land. Investigation of local records revealed that the land was owned by a man named Richard Redkin. The Foundation staff contacted Mr. Redkin under the guise of being federal agents investigating a crime that had been committed on the property while he was away. Mr. Redkin happily cooperated with the agents, explaining to them that he had never experienced any abnormal events on the property while he was living there, but that he had not resided on the land for some time. Strangely, he claimed to not know the road as Wagriwa Road, insisting that as far as he knew it had never had an official name, being nothing more than a long driveway out to his property. When asked if he could remember anything else abnormal about the location, he told the agents no, but that his daughter had written many fictional stories about strange happenings on the land, and perhaps those had somehow turned into rumors and then urban legends, though that was a long time ago. When the agents requested to meet with the daughter, he explained that it was impossible. She had drowned many years prior in the nearby Shenandoah River. The agents again examined the local records and found that Mr. Redkin wasn't lying. His daughter really had passed away, and her body was found in the river. The timing of this accident was quite coincidental though, as it had occurred exactly one week before the first missing person in the area was reported. Quickly realizing that something was not quite right with this piece of land, the SCP Foundation authorized the purchase from Mr. Redkin, who was more than happy to sell, and a research outpost was constructed to further investigate the anomalous events which had collectively been dubbed SCP-4434. While exploring the surrounding area, they soon found what so many others had before. The bizarre billboards, imploring one to both get away as well as come to Wagriwa Road to find what you are looking for. The signs, which were designated as SCP-4434-A, were found on roads across the West Virginia, Maryland, and Virginia tri-state area, but their locations would often change, with the billboards only manifesting for short amounts of time before vanishing and reappearing elsewhere. Bizarrely, when attempts were made to photograph or videotape the signs, the resulting footage would show only a blank, white sign. The Foundation knew that they needed to investigate further, and several experiments were authorized to find just what was happening on the land at the end of the mysterious road. A D-Class personnel, D-84021, was given a radio and implanted with GPS locators in his neck, torso, and thigh, and sent down the road with orders to report back on what they experienced, though unlike the people who had gone missing, he was not shown the billboard prior to entering the area. The D-Class walked to the end of the road, where he reported that a creature was emerging from a path leading into the woods. He soon exclaimed that the creature was a dog that he used to own. The researchers monitoring the test were confused since the dog had apparently been deceased for some time, and yet, here it was standing in front of him. Although the D-Class had seemed hesitant at the start of the mission, once he saw his childhood dog, all of his fears were set aside, and he willingly followed it deeper into the forest. After 90 seconds, the D-Class reported that he had entered a clearing and was being surrounded by a group of deer. The report stopped soon after and were replaced by the sound of screams as D-84021 was attacked and apparently consumed by the deer. Two of the three GPS trackers remained active for the next 40 minutes, and SCP researchers followed their path as they moved to the middle of the clearing and then appeared to enter a sinkhole or cave of some sort, where they traveled slowly in a winding pattern downward until contact was lost. Following this test, the Foundation researchers suspected that the creature that would emerge from the woods, which had been designated as SCP-4434-B, was able to change forms into one that would be trusted by those who entered the 4434 area. The deer, on the other hand, seemed to always maintain their appearance, and the whole group was designated as SCP-4434-C. The tests were far from over, though. For the next, two D-classes were sent into SCP-4434 in order to see what form 4434-B would take when more than one person was present. Just like before, an entity emerged from the woods, but this time, it took the form of a young man in a suit who immediately offered to clear any and all debts the D-Classes held, as well as expunging their criminal records, freeing them from their life as test subjects. All they would need do is follow him into the woods. The agents monitoring the test ordered the D-Classes not to follow the man, but they were ignored, and the researchers listened as they instead began conversing with SCP-4434-B, seeming to be quite interested in his offer. 
They soon followed him into the woods, and just over two minutes later, they too were attacked and consumed by SCP-4434-C. It appeared now that once someone entered the SCP-4434 area, they were all but helpless to resist the compulsive effects of SCP-4434-B. The Foundation researchers wanted to test the limits of SCP-4434's power, and so they then came up with a rather creative procedure for the next test. Another D-Class personnel was sent down the road, but this one was wearing a body harness that was connected to a pulley system, as well as being equipped with a camera. He was ordered to wait at the edge of the SCP-4434 area until the 4434-B entity appeared. The entity soon emerged, taking the form of a middle-aged woman. As soon as the D-Class was seen conversing with the entity and agreed to follow it, the pulley was engaged in order to forcibly pull him out of the area. This was followed by an entirely unexpected event. The middle-aged woman quickly produced a knife and with a supernatural speed, severed the rope on the pulley system. The now free D-Class stood up, followed the woman into the woods, and was consumed soon after. The researchers were growing frustrated with their lack of advancement in understanding the anomaly, and so for the fourth test, they decided to take quite extreme measures. A drone was used to fly over the area, which identified the mouth of the cave that the GPS trackers had been taken into. It was a three and a half meter wide hole in the ground, too dark to see anything past the entrance, and the drone installed an anchor point in the ground at the mouth of the hole before flying in to explore further. But the signal was almost immediately lost. Progress had been made, though. Yet another D-Class was selected, this time one who had climbing experience. D-84041 was warned in advance that the SCP-4434-B entity would appear to her and would have a compulsive effect, and that she was to ignore them no matter what form they took and instead proceed as quickly as possible to the cave, which had been designated as SCP-4434-D. D-84041 was taken to the road, and she immediately began running down the path into the woods. She was able to reach the mouth of the cave without seeing any anomalous entities, neither 4434-B nor the carnivorous deer. She quickly attached the rope she had brought to the anchor that was installed by the drone and began rappelling into the hole. As she descended down, she described the normal, rocky cave one that grew wetter the further down she went. Surprisingly, she soon reached the bottom, where she found a spherical room, roughly 8 meters across. But this was not anything like the entrance to the cave. The floor of this room wasn't made of rock or dirt. It was more like flesh, and it appeared to be breathing. And there was something else down there too, a folded piece of paper with writing on it. The D-Class was ordered to pick up the paper, take a sample of the cave floor, and exit the area as soon as possible, as there was no way to predict if the SCP-4434-B and C entities, or something worse, would soon appear. After taking a sample, she began climbing out of the cave. When she emerged, there were still no signs of any anomalous creatures, but she quickly made her way down the road and out of the SCP-4434 area. When she reached the waiting agents at the edge of the area, D-84041 handed them the sample and the paper that she found but then stopped and turned around. There on the ground roughly five meters away was a plate of food. Without any hesitation, she walked back into the SCP-4434 area, picked up the plate, and walked back into the woods. She was never seen again. It was now clear that 4434-B could take forms other than just humanoids and animals. As the objects that the D-Class had managed to get out of SCP-4434 were analyzed, the area's former owner, Richard Redkin, was again questioned by Foundation agents. They asked him if there was anything he failed to mention in their previous interview, and he told them that there was one thing that he preferred not to normally discuss. Just before his daughter's death, in addition to her fascination with writing and coming up with stories, she had become obsessed with the occult. When they asked him about the paper they had found within SCP-4434-D, he told them that it was very likely that she had written it. The SCP Foundation now understood why they had detected so many thaumaturgic particles in the area, which is the residual energy left over from a particular form of ritualistic practice that is more commonly known as magic or witchcraft. The contents of the paper found in the cave seemed to add additional weight to the theory that his daughter may have been involved in a ritual that led to the creation of SCP-4434, because written on the single page is a poem which reads, The forest is a sea, the wind is the waves, and the water is the leaves. The streams become undercurrents, the birds become fish, and coral finds its home as fungus, growth sprouting as I wish. The ground is the shore, pulling me by the feet, dragging me down, and pulling me back, back and forth on repeat. I dove down past the light, down where I couldn't breathe, and found nature looking for a fight. Yes, the forest is a sea, 
but I've made it barely big enough for me. The forest is a sea, so now something's bound to come eat. Things only became more mysterious, though, when Foundation researchers performed a DNA test on the sample taken from the bottom of the SCP-4434-D cave. What they found was that it was, just as D84041 had described, a flesh-like substance, and that it was a 78.9% match to Melanocetus johnsoni, better known as the deep-sea anglerfish. And there was one final discovery to be made as well. Linguistic teams within the Foundation investigated the name of the road that had appeared on the SCP-4434-A billboards, and discovered that the word was very similar to the Native American Tutelo tribe word Wagriwa, which roughly translates to the phrase, I have come back. Your phone suddenly vibrates. A text alert. Nothing too surprising about that. But you don't recognize the number. You open the message, and there's no text, just a picture. A strange figure dressed all in black, with a face that looks like the skull of a dog. Who sent this, you think to yourself? Is this a prank? You try to put it out of your mind and go about your day. The next day, there's another message from the same number. You open this one to find the same dog skull-faced creature staring back at you. But this time, you recognize the background. Is that your house he's standing in front of? Now you're getting a little freaked out. Someone is trying to mess with you, you're sure of it. But what can you do? Another couple days pass, and you get another message. You don't need to look to know it's that same number again. You've been getting plenty of these over the last few days. You're really scared now, and you run out of the house to your car. You've got to get out of here. You drive, and while stopped at a light, you decide to finally check this latest message and see what it is. It's the creature again, but this time, it's a picture of him sitting in the back seat of your car. You put your phone down and slowly turn your head. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob. And this is SCP-1471, also known as Mallow version 1.0.0. SCP-1471 is a very interesting anomaly that's not really a creature or a monster or even an object. It's a mobile app. It's 9.8 megabytes in size and is freely available in online application stores where it's listed under the name Mallow version 1.0.0. There's no developer listed on any of the stores, and it seems as though the app is somehow able to bypass the normal application approval process and appear directly on the stores for wide distribution. Once SCP-1471 is downloaded and installed on a device, there are no icons, shortcuts, or widgets like you'd expect when installing software. It also does not appear on program managers, and once installed, it seems there's no way to remove it. Within three to six hours of installing the app, the individual whose device it is will begin receiving mysterious picture messages. All of these images will have one thing in common. Somewhere in the foreground or background is a large humanoid figure with a canine-like skull for a head and long black hair. This creature has been designated SCP-1471-A. Sometime during the first 24 hours following the installation of SCP-1471, the individual's device will start to receive slightly different images from before. These images still always contain instances of 1471A, but now the locations will be recognizable to the individual. These pictures will be of places that the individual regularly frequents, like their local grocery store, their school, or their work. These sorts of images will continue to be received until 48 hours since the initial installation has passed. At that point, the device will start to receive images of places that the individual recently visited, like an image of the restaurant where they picked up their lunch an hour ago. Just as before, all of these images have SCP-1471-A somewhere in them, as if it's been following them and wants them to know it. After 72 hours, things get even stranger. Now the pictures received by the individual will be of them in real time. They might receive a picture of themselves sitting on the couch, taking in that exact moment, except SCP-1471-A is standing right behind them. But when they look, there's nothing there. It's as if someone is photoshopping in this bizarre canid creature, but doing so impossibly fast. 
Finally, after over 90 hours have passed since the app was installed, the weirdness reaches its peak. The individual no longer receives photo messages, but instead will start to catch glimpses of SCP-1471-A in real life, either in their peripheral vision, in reflective surfaces, or in both. At this point, the individual afflicted will continue having visualizations of SCP-1471-A in the real world, a result that so far has been irreversible. Individuals who have reached this extreme stage of exposure have reported that the entity appears to be trying to visually communicate with them, but none of them have been able to understand or comprehend whatever message it's trying to relay. Such was the case with a subject named William. William had first been exposed to SCP-1471 at 15 years old when his sister, Sarah, showed him an app she had downloaded earlier in the day. The app's description states that you will never have to settle for awkward feelings of being alone ever again. That Mallow is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued, and that after just a few hours of Mallow, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Neither William nor his sister knew how the app worked, but they assumed it was tracking them using some kind of GPS, and soon, William was receiving images from SCP-1471. The first one he received was of his school's courtyard, with SCP-1471-A, barely noticeable, sitting on a bench. He had black, matted fur, knife-like claws, a set of blank, pure white eyes, and a face that looked like the skull of a beast with a large, wolfish grin. William was immediately frightened by this, but Sarah insisted it was cute and funny. William wasn't so sure. The pictures continued over the following days, with SCP-1471-A appearing at his school, at his bus stop, on his street, nearly everywhere he went. And then, the pictures started appearing as if they had just been taken the moment they were received. William and Sarah were both being sent the same type of nightmare-inducing images, and they tried to delete the app from their phone to stop them, but they couldn't find where the application was stored. Then, things got even worse. The creature started appearing to William and Sarah in the real world. William, as it turns out, was the lucky one, as SCP-1471-A primarily appeared to him in reflective surfaces like mirrors, which he could cover with a curtain when he didn't want to see the strange dog skull face with its toothy grin staring back at him. Sarah was less fortunate. She saw the creature everywhere she looked, it always appearing just outside of her periphery, catching glimpses out of the corner of her eye, or feeling it looming over her and watching her as she slept. William has been able to cope with the appearances of 1471A, even regarding it as a somewhat comforting presence at times. Sarah, sadly, was driven mad by the never-ending visions of the creature. Currently, the only known treatment to reverse the effects of SCP-1471 and the appearances of 1471A is to eliminate the individual's exposure to the images before 90 hours have passed after installing the app. Once those 90 hours have elapsed, though, it is too late, and SCP-1471-A becomes a permanent presence in the individual's life. Thankfully, 1471-A has thus far remained non-hostile and has not been shown to pose a threat to those afflicted by it, at least not a physical threat. All mobile devices that are found to have Mallow version 1.0.0 installed on them are to be confiscated and analyzed for any potential information as to who might have created the application, as well as leads for other devices that may have been infected. Following this investigation, the device's batteries are to be removed and the device placed in Storage Unit 91 at Research Site 45. Additionally, all online application stores for mobile devices are to be monitored to prevent unsuspecting users from inadvertently downloading the anomalous software. Any individuals who are suspected of having downloaded SCP-1471 will have their device targeted by a self-uploading malware that can disable it until it's able to be seized by Foundation agents. Due to the unpredictable nature of the anomaly and the potential sentience of the software itself, SCP-1471 has been classified as Euclid by the SCP Foundation and research into ways to hopefully one day contain the anomalous software is ongoing. Two recreational divers are swimming along the seafloor nearly a hundred feet below the surface. 
This husband and wife duo are no strangers to scuba diving, and they move effortlessly through the water as they marvel at the various fish and plant life that normally remain unseen by humans. The woman taps her husband on the shoulder and points in the direction of a forest of kelp before starting to swim towards it. The man is about to follow when he sees something out of the corner of his eye. He stops and turns to get a better look. A few dozen meters away is a group of people. The man is confused. He looks back towards his wife, who is motioning for him to follow her. He raises a single finger as if to say, I'll be with you in a minute, and starts to swim in the direction of the strange crowd of people standing on the seafloor. He still can't make out exactly what he's looking at. A light current is causing silt to kick up and hang in the air, obscuring his view. As he gets closer, though, everything becomes clear. It really is a group of people, standing perfectly still, 30 meters underwater. But they aren't living people, of course. They are statues. The man can see now that these are statues of children. They are standing in a circle, facing outwards, and each one is holding hands with the statues next to them, forming an unbroken ring. He swims closer to get a better look. The statues are covered in algae and other plant life. He doesn't know who or why someone would make this strange art piece, but whatever their reasons, it looks like it's been down here a long time. He swims around the circle and counts more than 20 in total, with each one looking to be unique. While the center of the circle of statues is empty, there's pieces of bricks and concrete scattered all around it. There used to be something down here, a building or some kind of structure that once housed the statues and has now collapsed. It seems impossible that anything could have ever been built down here. He looks back in the direction of his wife, but he can't see her. She must be somewhere along the kelp investigating her own mysteries. He's about to head in her direction when he notices something. The inside of the circle isn't empty. Something is inside, sticking out of the sand. He swims up above the ring to get a better look. There's definitely something buried in the circle of statues. He can see now that it is the corner of what looks to be a metal box. He swims down closer to the box and reaches a hand out towards it when he suddenly stops and looks up. The woman swims out of the dense kelp forest carrying a brightly colored shell. She can't wait to show her husband how beautiful it is. She looks around but there's no sign of him. She looks in the direction that he swam and spots the same strange group of people that he did. As she swims towards them, she also quickly realizes that these are just statues. Very odd ones, but statues nonetheless. She also notices the rubble that surrounds them. The broken chunks of concrete, bricks, some bones… wait, bones? That's when she spots something else lying on the ocean floor just outside the ring of statues. It's her husband's scuba tank, with his shattered mask resting on top. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-1451, also known as Sunken Children's Perimeter. SCP-1451 is the designation that has been given to an anomalous set of metal statues that possess very strange and deadly properties. The 26 statues, each of which is unique and have been given the designations SCP-1451-1 through 26, all resemble human children and range in height from 1.32 to 1.43 meters. They are located within an ocean inlet on the seafloor and are arranged in a circle facing outwards, with each holding hands with the ones next to it, forming an unbroken ring. These statues are anything but stationary though, at least some of the time, and in fact they have three distinct stages of motion, which the SCP Foundation refers to as Class 1 through 3 scenarios. The first, a Class 1 scenario is the designation given when no movement is detected at all. This is the state that the statues appear to spend the majority of their time in. The designation will change to Class 2 when some slight movement of the statues is detected. In this state, they can be seen to slowly raise and lower their hands, while also subtly moving together in a counterclockwise direction. Bubbles have been observed coming from the statues' mouths during this scenario. SCP-1451 will be seen to behave this way when a large object comes near it and it will often mean that the statues are preparing to transition into a Class 3 scenario. A Class 3 scenario will be triggered when a solid object that weighs more than 40 grams enters the center of the circle. When the object, whether it be a living one or not, enters this activation area, the statues will fully animate and turn their attention on the object with only one purpose, to destroy it. When the statues enter a Class 3 scenario, they exhibit incredible strength and agility. They appear to possess at least a rudimentary form of intelligence as well, as they have been seen utilizing teamwork and advanced tactics. 
Once the statues have been activated, they are relentless in the pursuit of their targets, stopping at nothing to neutralize them. Should you manage to make it out of the activation area, the statues will still continue to give chase, and in one case, they followed a target over a kilometer before finally overtaking it. Once they get their hands on a target, death and destruction are all but assured. They will rip and tear anything that enters their circle apart, be it man or machine, with their metallic hands. Once they have eliminated the object, the statues will then return to their Class 1 scenario position. Attempts to intercept the statues as they return to their activation area will lead to what the Foundation has dubbed the Class 3.5 scenario, during which they will destroy anyone or anything that tries to intervene or prevent them from reaching their destination. While SCP-1451 might seem to be one of the simpler anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, there may just be more to this story than first meets the eye. And in fact, the sunken children's perimeter may not even be the first anomaly that was contained here. Those with Foundation Overseer level clearance have access to some rather interesting documents that help to fill in just what SCP-1451 might really be, and more importantly, what they're protecting. The documents include a manifest of the materials that were initially recovered from the area where SCP-1451 was discovered. These materials included roughly 20 kilograms of bricks, 4,000 kilograms of containment-grade concrete, the type normally used in SCP Foundation sites, and most interesting of all, a damaged Scranton box. For those unaware, Scranton boxes were the precursors to Dr. Scranton's much better known reality anchors. These powerful devices are used to contain reality-warping anomalies and prevent them from bending the fabric of our universe to their whims. Dr. Scranton's initial research into the technology produced an early version that was used in the containment of anomalies, though we now know that the technology was flawed and could lead to failures in containment. In the case of SCP-1451, a document was partially recovered from the Scranton box that alludes to just such a failure. In this instance, a powerful Euclid-class reality warper was being held at Area 56, a location that the Foundation has no record of ever having existed. The corrupted file seems to suggest that the reality warping SCP's primary anomalous attribute was that things it believed to be real would become real. If it misconceived reality in any way, its anomalous abilities would force that misconception to become actual reality. For example, after the anomalous entity referred to an agent assigned to its containment as a child, the agent was at risk of undergoing various physical and mental changes to truly become a child. It appears that the anomaly may have begun conflating various aspects of its containment, mixing up the concepts of containment itself. The metal of its cage, the concrete of its cell, the child agent involved with its containment, the SCP Foundation itself, they all became entangled within the reality warping anomaly's mind and appear to have been jumbled together in such a way that led to the creation of SCP-1451 a group of metal children who are eternally on guard and destroy anything that tries to breach their perimeter. Just what happened to Area 56, the personnel who were stationed there, or the powerful reality-warping anomaly they contained, continues to be a mystery. SCP-1451 has been classified as Euclid and is considered to be effectively contained at its current location. A sphere of wire mesh netting has been erected around it in order to ensure that no objects enter its activation area, but in the event that an object does manage to enter the circle, the statues are to be remotely monitored, and no attempts whatsoever are to be made to try and rescue the person or object that triggered the Class 3 scenario. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. They age out of trick or treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. They age out of the sense of wonder and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. 
But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow, and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party, and before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door, staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen, the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself, but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word, doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. Then, the screams go quiet, nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. The figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watch their even more unfortunate friend 
encountered the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, 
so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to enter the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096 and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 report some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. You're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. 
that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semiohazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. Two, an AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grabbed the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. The group of children on their bikes stare intently at the large, abandoned house. Rumors have been circulating all school year about a monster that lives inside. One child tells the others about the kid from a couple towns over who went inside and never came back out, and it's easy to believe that something evil could be lurking inside the rundown home with its peeling paint and many broken windows. The children begin teasing each other, daring one another to go in and see the monster for themselves. No one seems especially eager to volunteer, though, as they all egg each other on. As the group of children joke about who should be forced to go inside, another comes riding up behind them, struggling to catch his breath. You left me behind again, he complains. Clearly, this is not the first time that this smallest child of the group has been made to try and keep up with his bigger and faster friends. The bigger kids all turn to look at him. They don't need to discuss it any further. The answer to who must go inside has already been decided. The smaller child tries to protest, but ultimately, what decision does he have but to go inside? He can't let everyone else think that he's a chicken. He's got to prove once and for all that he's just as tough as any of them. Without another word, he lets his bike fall into the dirt and makes his way towards the big, creepy house. The door pushes open without any resistance, and the boy looks into the dark house. The boy steps inside, and the floorboards creak loudly under his feet. The inside looks much like the outside, old, worn, and abandoned. But then, he hears something, a scratching noise coming from above him. He turns to leave, but he can see all of his friends through the doorway, and they motion for him to keep going. The boy steals his nerves and turns back. He's going to show them just how brave he is. 
the boy starts up the stairs, each one groaning as he steps onto it. He reaches the top of the stairs to find a landing with more rooms, each full of dirt and debris. There's spray paint on many of the walls and lots of trash. It looks like teens may use this as a place to hang out. But there at the other side of the landing is one more room, and the door is shut. From outside, the group of children can see through the upper windows as the boy makes his way through the house. They're not laughing and teasing any longer. In fact, they're impressed by how bravely he is exploring the old home. Though none of them would admit it out loud, he's earning their respect. The boy reaches the shut door at the end of the hall and presses his ear to it, but he doesn't hear anything inside. He places his hand on the doorknob and slowly opens it. The boy screams and falls backwards as the cat that was hiding inside panics and jumps through one of the open windows. The boy can't help but laugh. <laughs> of course it was just a… The boy screams again as the floor gives way beneath him and crashes down onto the first floor in a pile of debris. He's stunned by the fall before starting to scream again as that floor gives way too. His yelling is silenced by the air being knocked out of him as he hits the basement floor. He's covered in dust and pieces of two floors he fell through. He feels bruised and sore, but he can wiggle his fingers and toes. He's not paralyzed, and it doesn't even feel like he's broken a bone. Maybe he's okay. But no, he's definitely not okay. Because suddenly, there's something picking him up off the floor. As his eyes adjust to the dark basement, he sees what it is that's holding him. It's half man, half machine, a huge disgusting mix of metal and flesh. The boy is too scared to scream anymore as the creature's unmoving, dead-looking eyes stare straight into his. Its face looks as though the skin has been stretched across a human metallic skull. The boy can only watch as the monster raises its sharp metallic fingers and brushes the dirt out of the boy's hair. The boy starts to whimper, but whatever this thing is, it doesn't seem to want to hurt him. A tinny, robotic voice coming from a small device on the creature's face suddenly breaks the silence. Al-Anta ala mayuram. The boy doesn't understand, but the robotic man tilts his horrific head to the side and repeats the same thing. The boy is still confused, but he feels like the robot is trying to tell him something. He somehow gets the sense that it's not going to hurt him. Is this the monster that everyone has been afraid of? A misunderstood machine man living down here in the basement? The robot flinches as something is smashed on the back of his head. He tosses the boy to the side and turns to see the boy's friends, each of them armed with pieces of wood and other scraps as weapons. They've come here to save their friend from the monster that they dared him to find. Another runs up to strike the robot, but before he can reach him, he falls to his knees in pain, as do the rest of the children. The creature has begun emitting a high-frequency noise, and the children try to cover their ears. They all feel a searing pain that makes it feel as though their heads will explode. The piercing noise continues to ring out, but the monster looks like it has entered some kind of dormant state and is no longer moving. The small boy is able to slowly get back to his knees, hands still clasped to the side of his head, and stand up. He runs past the monster and his friends who are writhing on the floor in pain, up the stairs and out of the old house. A woman stands at a kitchen counter, chopping vegetables for their dinner that evening, and talking to her oldest daughter about her plans for that weekend, when the back door suddenly bursts open. Standing there is her son, the small boy. He's barely able to whisper the words, Monster! There's a monster in the basement! Before he collapses, blood pouring from his ears and nose, before he begins convulsing on the floor. At the local police station, an officer is speaking on the phone. I see. Yes, that is quite strange. A metal man? You don't say. I'll send someone out there right away. Don't go anywhere. The police officer hangs up the phone and looks around, making sure no one is nearby or listening to him, and then takes out a cell phone. He dials a number from memory, and someone answers on the other end almost immediately. Yes, this is Field Agent Patch, the police officer says. You need to get a containment team out here right away, and a good one too. I don't know what it is, but it's dangerous. An SCP Foundation mobile task force that specializes in containing dangerous humanoid threats soon arrived at the house and took the anomaly into captivity. Misinformation teams concocted a cover story about a gas leak leading to the unfortunate deaths of several of the town's children and administering amnestics to any potential witnesses. Once the messy business of containment was over, though, it was time to figure out just what this strange creature was. SCP-203 appears to have at one time been a Caucasian human male, though its appearance now is far different than it once was. This bipedal humanoid creature stands 2.5 meters tall and weighs roughly 200 kilograms. Both its incredible height and weight are due to the fact that the man's original skeleton has been entirely removed and replaced with a mechanical framework made of cast iron. 
The metal skeleton is much larger than the original bones, and in many places SCP-203's skin has split from being stretched over it, revealing the mechanical structure underneath. Other parts of the framework appear to have been intentionally made to protrude through the skin, though it is unclear for what purpose. In addition to this larger-than-normal mechanical skeleton, a number of other augmentations are present on SCP-203. Its fingers have been extended into sharpened, hook-like barbs that are approximately one meter long. Its lips have been removed entirely, making it clear that there is no movable jawbone and that the skull is likely one large hollow piece of metal and there are several more hook-like protrusions jutting out around the mouth area, smaller but similar in appearance to the fingers. SCP-203's legs have been modified as well, with two added joints that give them an appearance more akin to a dog's and its toes have been removed and replaced with a solid piece of metal similar to those found in steel-toed boots. Its chest has no sternum or breastplate, which causes the skin stretched across to pull inward as its diaphragm contracts. Its ears have also been removed, though it still seems to possess hearing that is far beyond that of an average human. And while its eyes still remain, they are held in a permanently forward-facing position by several needles that emerge from the eye sockets. The irises also appear permanently dilated and do not react to light. In place of a mouth is a small speaker covered by a metal grate that is capable of producing basic vocalizations, though with a distinctly robotic sound to them. Tests have shown that SCP-203 has a basic understanding of English, but its own primary language seems to be a type of Arabic, though there are no records of the exact dialect. SCP-203 does not need to eat or drink, and without any visible mouth, it is likely incapable of either. Instead, it runs off of a power cell located within its body that will provide energy for up to 72 hours. After those three days, SCP-203 will shut down and enter a hibernation state for three to four hours, during which its power source will recharge, providing it with another 72 hours of energy. All attempts to examine SCP-203 by either X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and other forms of diagnostic imagery have failed, and attempts at exploratory surgery have triggered its defense mechanisms which are both painful and deadly. When it perceives that it is being threatened in some way, SCP-203 is capable of emitting a high-frequency droning sound that has a profoundly damaging effect on the human nervous system. The effects of this defense mechanism were able to be observed directly when a D-Class personnel accidentally struck SCP-203 and its droning sound was activated. Immediately after being exposed to the sound, D-104 experienced a severe headache. After 15 minutes, the headache grew worse and D-104 began to bleed from the ears. After a half hour, the D-Class who had now gone to the infirmary began to experience seizures and was bleeding from all of his orifices. Ten minutes later, the D-Class was dead. Another test was performed, and the results were nearly identical, with symptoms progressing at roughly the same rate. However, this time, rather than move the D-Class to the infirmary, it was kept in the cell with SCP-203. After 40 minutes, the D-Class was dead, and a few minutes later, 203 finally ceased its droning sound. SCP-203 then approached the body of the deceased D-Class and began to use its own augmentations to start removing the skeleton of the D-Class. While SCP-203 was stopped before it could complete its task, it now appears that the droning sound it produces is a defense mechanism but may also be a part of the process by which it creates new instances of SCP-203. In interviews with SCP-203, it claims to have no memories of its life prior to its augmentation. It says that it now exists in a near constant state of pain and confusion, and that the times when its battery is expended and it enters a rest state are its only escape from the pain of its existence. It also claims that it has no memory of what happens once its defense mechanism is activated, nor does it remember what it did to the body of the D-Class that was left in its cell. However, it is unknown just how truthful SCP-203 is being. There has been no way to verify anything that SCP-203 tells researchers, and for the time being, its statements are to be regarded by Foundation staff as an attempt to elicit sympathy or otherwise manipulate them emotionally. It's made several requests for pain-killing medication and anesthetics, but so far, all of these requests have been denied. SCP-203 has been classified as Euclid, and it is kept in a specialized storage bunker at a research site. Two D-Class personnel equipped with sound filtering equipment guard it at all times, and it is accompanied by an armed escort to any testing or research sessions. Is SCP-203 the ultimate victim? A normal human that was transformed against his will into a crude amalgamation of man and machine? Maybe there is something more to SCP-203, or rather, less. Is SCP-203 fooling all of us? 
Is this tortured iron soul nothing more than a metallic monster disguising itself with the skin of its last victim? Perhaps with more research, we will one day know the answer. Two men walk through a hot, dusty tunnel carved right into the rock. Their torches cast just enough light to see that the walls are covered with strange hieroglyphics. They've been in many tombs before, but they've never seen markings like these before. They spot something up ahead, a person slumped against the wall. One of the men rushes over and sees that whoever this was, they've been here a very long time. Nothing is left but bones and a few scraps of cloth. As the man examines the skeleton, his partner calls him over. There's something he has to see. He's looking through a hole in the tunnel wall, and on the other side is an enormous cavern. In the middle of the giant room is the strangest sight either man has ever seen. An enormous upside-down pyramid that stretches down from the roof of the cave. They look at each other in amazement before running down deeper into the tunnel, sure that it will lead them to the pyramid and the incredible treasures it must have inside. They can see through more holes in the tunnel wall that they are getting closer and closer to the pyramid. Finally, they reach an entrance into the uppermost and widest part of the structure. As they enter the upside-down pyramid, they see that the passages are at least twice as high as any they've ever seen, and are covered with more of the strange markings. They start walking through the passageway, and soon realize that there are numerous twists, turns, branching paths, and dead ends. It's a maze. The man turns to tell his friend that they should consider leaving and coming back with others, but he finds that he's all alone. They must have gotten separated at some point. He starts backtracking through the passages, turning this way and that, trying to retrace his steps. He abruptly stops, though, when he hears a strange noise. A metallic grinding sound fills the air. The man watches as the walls themselves start to move, shifting and rearranging themselves. Without warning, the open passage in front of him closes, sealing his path back. The man begins to scream. There's no answer to his cries. Panicked, he runs deeper and deeper into the maze, but try as he might, he can't find his friend or the exit. How long has he been walking? Hours? Days? He can remember hearing the walls shift at least one other time. Exhausted, he sits down against the wall. He'll just take a little rest, then it's back to work. He must be able to find his way out. He must escape. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-875 also known as War Criminals. SCP-875 is the designation the SCP Foundation has given to a massive underground pyramid whose exact location is a closely guarded secret. As of yet, no record of the pyramid's construction has been found in any historical documents, though there is evidence that suggests SCP-875 is a man-made structure. While the outside of SCP-875 is made of normal sandstone like the pyramids of Egypt, there is an inner layer composed of a metal alloy that has yet to be identified. The first floor of SCP-875 is accessible through a tunnel and contains a number of passageways that appear to have been built for entities much taller than humans. These passages are arranged into a maze-like configuration, complete with double backs and dead ends. Adding to the confusion is that the geography of the maze periodically changes. Mechanisms located within the walls and floor activate automatically every 48 hours completely changing the layout. While anyone unlucky enough to be trapped within the shifting walls of SCP-875 may find themselves unable to leave by the path they entered, there are a number of hidden pressure plates and levers that can be found throughout the labyrinth that open up sections of the wall, creating new paths and shortcuts. But these switches also cause the release of what the Foundation has designated SCP-875-1. SCP-8751 are small, flying, insect-like creatures, approximately 6 centimeters long, with a mass of roughly 3 grams. They bear no resemblance to any known species of insect on Earth, suggesting that their origin may be extraterrestrial. When released, SCP-8751s will swarm the nearest person, stinging them mercilessly. Their sting is highly acidic and causes severe damage to nerves and tendons, and this potent acid combined with their tendency to swarm, has resulted in victims' limbs becoming what can only be described as liquefied. Previous uses of explosives within the pyramid have left openings to a lower second floor that are relatively easy to access, provided that the maze's current configuration allows the breaches to be reached. 
The main feature of the second floor is four large vats, each of which contains a clear liquid similar in appearance to normal water that has been designated SCP-8752. When humans are exposed to SCP-8752, they experience effects similar to an amnestic, but with the added sensation of feeling both happy and satisfied. Following what look like maintenance tunnels on the second floor leads down to a third floor of the pyramid that is home to a large nuclear reactor. The reactor takes up most of the area of this level of the pyramid and appears to be self-cooling with no evidence of a meltdown or other nuclear disaster having taken place. This reactor seems to be powering the rest of the pyramid, including the maze reorganizing mechanisms on the first floor, as well as what's hidden on the mysterious lowest level of SCP-875. Although there is no direct access to the fourth floor of the pyramid, tunneling through the floor of the third level has revealed something incredible. Inside a small room are what look to be ten separate cryogenic stasis chambers. The chambers are arranged in a circular formation, and strangest of all, they're all occupied. Inside each pod is a large, insectoid creature roughly three meters tall and weighing 240 kilograms that have been designated SCP-8753. Three of the creatures appear to have died from their stasis chambers failing at some point in the past, and heavy decomposition has set in. Several other of the insectoid creatures are heavily damaged, though it is unknown if this is due to issues with the pods, or if they had sustained injuries prior to entering stasis. While it is not known what exactly these creatures are, where they came from, or if their origin is even terrestrial, examination and analysis of some of the images carved into the walls of SCP-875's first floor have provided interesting information. In one, two figures that bear a resemblance to SCP-8753 are depicted facing each other, with one appearing to be stabbing the other with a spear, implying some kind of violent conflict in the past. In the next, another figure that looks like SCP-8753 is shown presenting a stone slab to what looks to be a human dressed in the garb of ancient Egypt. The Egyptian is facing away from the insectoid, which might suggest a breakdown in communication or an unwillingness of the Egyptian to listen to the insectoid. The third image, though, shows two humanoid figures now bowing to the insectoid figure, next to an image of a chalice with a drop of liquid falling into it. This may represent SCP-8752, the amnestic liquid, and the way its effects were used to subdue this group of people. This hypothesis is further strengthened by a fourth image that shows an insectoid figure watching two humanoids pulling what looks like a large stone block with ropes. A fifth image shows the insectoid figure standing next to what looks like a dead humanoid, consuming a part of it. And finally, a sixth image depicts the insectoid inside of a small rectangle that may represent the stasis chambers found on the lowest level of the pyramid. Are these entities sleeping inside the stasis chambers the same ones depicted on the walls of the pyramid? Did they arrive on Earth and subjugate a group of humans, forcing them to build a monument that could contain their stasis chambers and keep them in a form of perennial living death? Perhaps this question has been answered by a mysterious transmission that was detected by the Foundation. Coming from an unknown source, the transmission was in English, but the grammar and word choice sounded like it was from someone who had only the most basic understanding of the language. The transmission, in no uncertain terms, demanded the return of the war criminals, and that if they were not returned, that 95% of the species would be made extinct. It then went on to describe a number of offenses perpetrated by these war criminals, including claims of massacres and cannibalism. Were the creatures in the bottom of SCP-875 convicts on the run? War criminals from another planet or even another reality who had fled to Earth to escape justice? It may never be known for sure, as the message degraded and became unintelligible before it could finish. Due to its stable location and the relative ease with which the public can be kept away from it, SCP-875 has been classified as safe. Its location is marked as a military base on maps, with satellite images altered according to Procedure Watson-24. Civilians who approach the area are to be taken into Foundation custody and administered Class A amnestics. Research personnel are only allowed inside SCP-875 when accompanied by two security staff and six maintenance personnel are to monitor the nuclear reactor at all times. If any staff are stung by instances of SCP-8751, they are to be treated on-site by medical personnel with alkali to neutralize the acidic stings. And in extreme cases, amputation of the affected limbs is authorized. 
In the event that an SCP-8753 specimen becomes active, security personnel are to subdue them in a non-fatal manner if possible, and transport them to a secure site for further research. At first glance, it looks like a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Nothing to suggest that anything weird is going on here. Certainly, if the D-Class personnel assigned to investigate this facility had encountered this room in the wild, if you walked into a bathroom that looked like this while visiting a friend's house or lunching in a restaurant or even stopping at a gas station rest stop, you wouldn't have any reason to think anything was amiss. But this is the SCP Foundation, so he knows that nothing here is as it seems. He glances briefly up at the camera installed in the ceiling. The lens aperture dilates briefly, focusing on his face, and he knows that an SCP technical on the other end is watching his every move. He grimaces, fully aware that his status as a member of D-Class personnel means that every experiment could be his last. That knowledge doesn't exactly endear him to the Foundation or its mission, but it's not like he has much of a choice in picking his assignments. Suddenly, a voice crackles to life over the intercom. Please step fully into the bathroom, says the researcher on the other end of the camera feed. What's this all about? asks the D-Class personnel. This is just a bathroom, isn't it? What's so special about this place? His eyes scan the room. The floor is covered with smooth white tiles. The walls are a soothing light blue color, reminiscent of a calm ocean, the sort of color that you might pick for its soothing effect when you need to make use of these facilities. A large mirror is fixed to the wall before a countertop with a sink. Next to the sink, there's a toilet, and next to that, a bathtub with a shower. There's a scrubbing brush and a plunger stashed behind the toilet tank, and a fuzzy shag cover stretched over the toilet lid. It's all very ordinary. It's much too ordinary, he thinks. A sudden horrible thought occurs to him. You're not gonna watch me use the toilet, he asks, a slight edge of panic in his voice. That's absurd, of course, but here at the SCP Foundation, there's nothing that he would put past these people. They've always got some new weirdness happening, and it wouldn't at all surprise him to learn that they would want to watch him at his most exposed. The voice comes back over the intercom. What? No, you don't need to use the... Look, just step forward. Literally all that I want you to do is to step into the room. The D-Class smirks to himself. He's already been through more of these crazy experiments than he would care to remember, and he has the scars to prove it. It gives him a small measure of satisfaction to hear the agent getting flustered. Even if he has to participate in these dangerous experiments, he can at least make things awkward for his tormentors. That seems like a little bit of poetic justice to him. As the agent requested, though, he steps forward. The moment that he's cleared the threshold, the door slams behind him with a crash. The D-Class jumps in surprise and shouts, What the? Why'd you do that? I didn't do that, says the voice over the intercom. Of course, thinks the D-Class personnel. He should have expected this. He grabs the doorknob and tries to yank the door open, but the door is stuck fast. He yanks again, harder this time, but the result is the same. The door doesn't budge at all. The door's stuck, cries the D-Class. He feels his heart start to beat faster, and his temperature begins to rise. What terrible thing does this room plan to do to him? But after a moment, he begins to calm down. It doesn't seem like this room is planning to do anything. Maybe it's just a room with a weird door. But if that were the case, then why would the SCP Foundation be interested in this? Just hang tight, says the agent. I'll see what I can do about getting that door open. A few moments later, the agent arrives at the door to the bathroom and gives it a sharp yank. It doesn't budge. Door's stuck she says. The D-Class rolls his eyes. Of course it's stuck. Hold on a second, I'll go get a technician, she says. The D-Class personnel listens to the sound of the agent's feet retreating into the distance. He sits down on the closed toilet and buries his face in his hands. What a day. Is he going to be trapped inside this bathroom forever? He can't help but speculate, but he tries not to think about it. He's more annoyed than anything, truth be told. He wonders if the agent is actually going for help or if she's still just sitting in her cubicle, watching him through the camera and waiting for the other shoe to drop. His eyes flick to the camera, and he furrows his brow. He's so intent on the camera that he doesn't notice as a dark shape slowly bubbles out from the bathtub drain. It's a cockroach, a perfectly ordinary cockroach. Or is it? The roach remains motionless for a moment, perfectly still, except for the subtle twitch of its antenna. Then, all at once, it starts to move. The roach scuttles across the tub, scaling the porcelain walls, and runs across the counter. Like all cockroaches, it seems confused now that it's emerged into the light and eager to find a dark corner where it can hide again. It reaches the edge of the countertop, but, of course, a sheer cliff is no obstacle for an insect. It shimmies down the cabinet and makes a dash across the tiled floor. 
That's when the moving roach finally catches the eye of the D-Class personnel. He yelps in surprise and pulls his feet up, his knees going flush with his chest. The roach looks oddly out of place in this clean and well-maintained bathroom, and the sight of this disgusting little vermin fills the D-Class with a sudden and deep sense of loathing. That's one massive cockroach, he mumbles to himself. Almost as if it heard his words, the roach starts to skitter toward him. The D-Class does not like that at all. Without hesitation, he immediately stomps on the roach, bringing his foot down with a definite thud, and then grinding the unfortunate insect under his heel. The sound is loud enough to attract the attention of the agent behind the camera. Apparently, she must have returned to her post after sending a request for a technician. What was that? She asks, her voice crackling over the intercom. There was a really huge cockroach, just came out of the tub. Come on, hurry up and get the door open. I don't like it in here. There might be more of them. Okay, okay, says the agent. Just hold on for a second. Help will be here in just a couple minutes. Don't be so jumpy, it's just a bug after all, nothing to worry about. The D-Class personnel isn't so sure of that. After all, when you're dealing with unknown anomalies like those in the SCP archives, can you ever just not worry? He pulls his shoe off, stands up from the toilet, and walks over to the sink. Grumbling to himself, he turns the faucet and starts to wash the insect icor off the bottom of his shoe. He's too intent on his activity to notice that a second cockroach has already popped out of the bathtub drain. Like the first one, it hesitates for a moment, and then it scuttles across the tub, scales the walls, and makes a beeline for its deceased comrade. As this happens, a third roach emerges from the drain, and a fourth. By the time the D-Class turns around, a whole battalion of cockroaches has entered the bathroom. His eyes go wide as he takes in the scene. A good dozen roaches have clustered around the first smashed roach, all feeding on its carcass. It's a grisly scene, and the D-Class is immediately revolted. He knows nothing about roaches, nothing that might suggest to him that this is in any way unusual behavior for these insects, but he doesn't really care. It looks disgusting, and he's positive that it isn't natural. I don't like this, I don't like this, he yells, panic rising in his voice. Get me out of here! Hurry up and open the stupid door! The observing agent, safe in her office, doesn't share the D-Class personnel's terror. From her point of view, she's just watching a man freak out over a couple of perfectly ordinary bugs. Of course, the scene takes on a whole different feel when you're not the one being asked to expose yourself to strange and potentially dangerous SCPs. She can't help but chuckle at the scene. It's not funny, cries the D-Class, once again jumping on the toilet and pulling up his legs into a fetal position. Those things are huge! You better get me out of here now, or… 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 He struggles to think of some threat that might convince the agent to take him seriously, but he fails. The agent is too busy taking notes on the situation. The roaches look to be ordinary specimens of the American cockroach, each about five or six centimeters long. When the group of roaches has devoured their smashed comrade, that's when things start to get really strange. The small group turns as one toward the D-Class. Now that is weird, thinks the agent. The D-Class probably thinks the same, because he starts to scream incoherently. Both agent and D-Class are so focused on the roaches that they don't notice something even more sinister happening in the bathtub. A dark, tar-like substance has started to seep out of the drain, gradually filling the bathtub. The agent is too busy trying to soothe the D-Class, trying to convince him to stop screaming and start explaining the scene to her in rational detail so that she can add his observations to her notes. Meanwhile, the oily black tar continues to bubble from the drain, the surface level rising, until the tub is approximately one-fifth full of black goo. The D-Class's eyes suddenly alight on the tub. What the… What, what's this? He mutters. Suddenly, dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds, of roaches start to rise from the black goo. They boil over the sides of the tub in massive chitinous waves, spreading across the floor of the bathroom in a solid sheet of glimmering black carapaces. It happens so fast that the D-Class can only gibber in mindless terror. There are too many roaches. For the moment, the D-Class seems safe perched on the toilet. The roaches can't scale up the shiny porcelain, slipping back down at every attempt. He scrambles to his feet, standing on top of the toilet lid and praying that it will hold his full weight. Otherwise, he's going to tumble head first into that writhing, seething swarm of vermin. He stares at what looks like an ocean of living insects, the light reflecting off their chitinous shells with an evil, oily gleam. It's like a scene out of a cheesy horror movie, but it's all too real. Through his panic, the D-Class vaguely recalls that when he was a kid, he once read a book about ancient life on Earth during the Permian era, when the Earth was a hot, humid jungle, when high temperatures and oxygen-rich air made the world perfect for giant insects. Cockroaches have lived on this Earth for how many million years, he wonders. He knows it's a lot, and he can't help but think about that legacy now that he's confronted with a living carpet made entirely out of roaches. 
Aren't scientists always predicting that cockroaches will eventually outlive humanity? They're the only nasty little things tenacious enough to survive a nuclear holocaust or the punishments of climate change. He's less worried that cockroaches will outlive humanity right now, though, and more worried that they might outlive him personally. The roaches can't get up the toilet, but they have more success in scaling the walls. Soon the walls are covered in a mass of roaches, the air filling with a constant cacophony of chittering and scratching that sends chills up the spine of the panicking D-Class. The roaches start to march across the ceiling, and the D-Class gets the distinct impression that, if he doesn't do something fast, he's going to be completely covered. In desperation, he throws his shoe across the room with all his might, shouting curses as he does, but it doesn't do any good. His shoe hits the opposite wall and bounces off, dropping into the swarm and quickly sinking beneath the rolling tide of chittering insects. His futile attack only provokes the insect mob, and several dozen roaches take flight, launching themselves at the D-Class. He shouts and claws them away as roaches land on his face and shoulders. They scramble up his neck and tangle themselves in his hair. He keeps shouting and swatting them away, but there are more and more of them every second. More roaches are swarming out from the black oil simmering in the bathtub every second, and now they all seem intent on the D-Class. They crawl inside his mouth as he screams. He gags and coughs, trying to spit them out, but it seems that they're already crawling down his throat. In his panic, he slips and lurches forward, screaming and flailing his arms helplessly. He dives into the writhing mass of roaches. Within seconds, he is covered in a sheet of living insects. The observing agent is speechless, unable to comprehend the sheer insanity of what she is seeing. But watching the D-Class be consumed by cockroaches prompts her to vomit in disgust. The retching, gagging noises can be heard over the intercom, hardly professional behavior, but we're way past worrying about that by now. By now, the bathtub is almost completely filled with black goo. The roaches start to return to the bathtub, scaling the tub walls in vast waves and throwing themselves into the pool of dark tar. As they retreat, they reveal the decimated remains of the D-Class. The corpse is ragged and bloody, partially eaten, its stomach visibly bloated. It twitches slightly, and the observing agent momentarily wonders if it's somehow possible that the D-Class personnel survived his ordeal, even though even a brief glance at the state of the corpse should make it clear it would be impossible. There's just far too much damage. It's obvious, in fact, that the twitching is caused by roaches that have burrowed into the body, squirming beneath its skin. Suddenly, something else begins to rise from the bathtub. It's another corpse, one in a much more advanced state of decomposition, to the point that it's nearly skeletal, but there's still enough flesh clinging to its bones that you might be able to recognize it for the person it used to be. Under the black ooze, there's still a ghost of a face clinging to the skull, liquefying eyeballs still rolling around loosely in its dark sockets, tattered lips hanging off of stained teeth. Its eyes swivel toward the prone body of the D-Class with malevolent intention. Black tar drips from its arms and skull. It places one hand against the rim of the bathtub, the other against the blue wallpapered wall, and slowly hoists itself up and out of the pool of black tar, displacing another few dozen cockroaches with its movements. The corpse slowly stumbles to its feet, dribbling black ichor, and steps out of the bathtub. It staggers across the room with sticky, uncertain steps, leaving a trail of roaches and black goo. When it reaches the body of the D-Class, it grabs it by the leg and then drags it back across the bathroom floor toward the tub. The skeletal corpse pulls the body of the D-Class personnel into the tub, and both of them submerge into the black goo. The remaining cockroaches follow suit, jumping into the black oil and slowly sinking below the surface. At the same time, the level of the black substance begins to fall as it starts to swirl away down the drain. After several minutes, the black goo has completely drained away, leaving no trace that it ever existed. The roaches, the strange living cadaver, and the corpse of the D-Class have all completely vanished, so that by the time the door of the bathroom clicks open again, there's nothing to suggest that there's anything at all strange about this room. Too late, the agent bursts into the room, flinging open the now unlocked door with all her might. She scans the room in confusion, knowing that just moments ago, it was the scene of grisly carnage. There's no evidence of that now, but just the memory, the sight of the D-Class's bloated corpse, the sound of thousands of cockroaches marching and scuttling in unison, is enough to make the bile rise in her throat. She leans forward, hands on her knees, and vomits again. She's seen a lot as an SCP Foundation agent, but this SCP is definitely not one for the faint of heart, or the sick of stomach. What just happened here? Unfortunately, this is far from an unusual occurrence when you're dealing with SCP-6698. SCP-6698 is to all appearances a perfectly ordinary bathroom. Until it started to manifest anomalous behavior, 
It existed as a second-story bathroom in a private residence somewhere in Alabama in the United States. The first instance of anomalous behavior happened the day after a resident of the household, a 16-year-old male, reported killing an unusually large cockroach in the bathroom. The following night, when using the same bathroom, that same resident was overheard yelling in fright. His screams were followed by sounds described as a sink breaking and then a body falling against a crunchy and wet surface. Other members of the family attempted to respond to these sounds, but found that the door to the bathroom refused to open. Once the noises subsided, they found the door suddenly quite pliable, but when they checked inside, they could not find any evidence of the bathroom's teenage victim. The SCP Foundation quickly responded to the incident, amnesticizing the family and planting a suggestion that the missing teenager simply ran away from home into their subconscious. The family was moved from the residence, which was then purchased by a Foundation shell company to allow for further testing. When a human enters the room, the door to the bathroom immediately closes and locks. The door will remain locked until the event is completed. Attempts to physically damage the door when it is in its locked state have all met with failure. A recording camera was installed in the bathroom to allow agents to observe the event as it unfolds. Victims who unknowingly wander into SCP-6698 will find themselves trapped. Moments after the door locks, cockroaches will start to emerge from the drain of the bathtub. Once the swarm has reached sufficient mass, the roaches will attack and feed upon the victim. At the same time, a black oil will start to fill the tub, laying the stage for the emergence of the mysterious tar zombie, which then removes the corpse of the victim from the scene. The observing agent noted that the skeletal corpse she saw emerge from the tub bore a superficial resemblance to the missing 16-year-old male, raising questions about how SCP-6698 might have bonded with its original victim. Testing was suspended following the death of the D-Class personnel, so it is currently unclear if the same tar zombie appears during every instance, or if perhaps SCP-6698 pulls from a rotating roster of previous victims during its manifestations. At this moment, the relationship between the tar zombie, the black ooze, and the legions of carnivorous cockroaches is unclear, but large amounts of spectral energy have been detected in the room, leading to an assumption that the event must be supernatural in nature and to the involvement of the Department of Spectral Phenomena. Since SCP-6698 only attacks victims who enter the bathroom and does not appear to be capable of manifestation once the door is open, the SCP Foundation has attached a special apparatus to prevent the door from closing of its own accord, and assigned SCP-6698 a designation of safe. One thing that is for sure, though, is that of all the ways that deadly SCP anomalies might choose to do away with their victims, being eaten alive from the inside by a swarm of scuttling cockroaches probably ranks up there as one of the worst. So that's something to think about the next time that you're looking for a little privacy in the bathroom. The boy screams as his body transforms. His bones warp and twist as feathers emerge from his pores and his skull sharpens into a long, hard beak. He's in a living nightmare. And who could have guessed it all started with an innocent attempt to play hooky? It's an ordinary Monday morning, and all over town, children are waking up and reluctantly dragging themselves out of bed for school. Some are oversleeping, hitting the snooze on their alarms, and getting a bit of extra shut-eye before their exhausted parents notice, wake them up, and rush to get them to school before the first morning bell. In one particular bedroom, a young boy is awake but still in bed, brainstorming as fast as he can. He is determined to skip school today however he can. He usually doesn't mind school very much, but today all he can think about is the math test he didn't study for and the mean classmate who likes to knock his books out of his hands. But he can't just ask to skip school for no reason. He has to come up with a plan. He runs to the bathroom, splashing hot water in his face to give him a flushed appearance and a warm forehead. Then he hops back into bed and begins to loudly cough and sniffle until his mother comes to check on him. He complains that he doesn't feel well enough to go to school and, sure enough, when his mother feels his forehead, it is hot to the touch. She agrees to let him stay home from school for the day, provided he stays in bed and gets plenty of rest. He promises that he will, and she leaves to go to work. On her way to work, the boy's mother remembers that there isn't much for him to eat while he's home alone all day. At least, there isn't much that he would want to eat while he's sick. She decides that she can be a little bit late to work for the sake of her son's health, and pulls into a nearby grocery store. She rushes out of her car and into the store, making a beeline for the soup aisle. She reaches for her usual go-to brand of chicken noodle soup, but finds the shelf completely bare. That's right, it's flu season. Of course, the soup is sold out. Oh great, this is exactly what she needs. A sick kid at home, one can of chicken noodle soup left at the store, and the machine won't even scan it. 
she smacks the side of the machine in frustration, and the screen reads, invalid code, transaction canceled. With a heavy sigh, she glances over her shoulder. No one is watching. She tried to pay for the can to do the right thing, but the machine wouldn't let her. So she grabs the can and runs out of the store before anyone can spot her. While his mother is out, the boys at home raid in the pantry for snacks to sate his not at all sick appetite. He fills up on Oreos and toaster pastries, cheesy crackers and chips. When he hears his mother's car pulling into the driveway, he quickly wipes the crumbs from his face and jumps back into bed, just in time for his mother to find him there, resting like he promised he would. She gives him a kiss on the forehead and tells him that she'll heat up some chicken noodle soup for him to eat. She's in a hurry to make it to work though, so she'll need to leave it in the microwave for him. She pours the contents of the soup into a bowl, adds a bit of water, and pops the bowl into the microwave for a few minutes. She calls up to her son, letting him know that the soup will be ready when the microwave dings. Then she rushes out the door and heads to work for the day, confident that her son will be fine through her shift. If he happens to need anything, he can call her and let her know. The boy hears the microwave ding, but his stomach is too full from his rummage through the pantry for him to want any of the soup, in spite of its heavenly aroma. Instead, he creeps into the living room and sits down to play video games until his eyes start to hurt. As he boots up his gaming system, he thinks for a moment that he can hear a strange noise coming from the kitchen, a soft, clucking sound, like the chickens he saw on his grandparents' farm. But he quickly forgets about the sound as the screen lights up, and he disappears into the world of his favorite game. He plays for hours, until the grumbling of his stomach interrupts his concentration. He's suddenly very hungry and remembers the soup his mother left in the microwave. It is certainly cold and unappealing by now, but he can just reheat it first. He punches the buttons on the microwave and waits for the soup to be ready. Again, he can hear strange noises coming from the microwave, but he doesn't think anything of it. The microwave dings and he pulls out the bowl of soup, grabs a spoon, and digs in. A little while later, the boy's mother pulls into the driveway in a panic. She left work early when her phone rang with a call from her son. She answered, asking what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer her. All she could hear on the other end was rustling, heavy breathing, and some pained grunting. Fearing the worst, she drove back as fast as she could, running several red lights along the way. Now she fumbles with her keys as she unlocks the door, terrified of what she will find. She grips her phone in her other hand, thumb hovering over the buttons, ready to dial 911 if the situation calls for it. She pushes the front door open, calling her son's name. He doesn't answer and her stomach drops. Suddenly, she hears the loud thud of something heavy being knocked to the ground. Something is terribly wrong here, and even though she might find her worst nightmare, she has to face whatever is waiting for her inside. She runs into the kitchen and finds it a mess. The bowl of soup is shattered on the floor, congealed, cold soup pooling on the tile. The kitchen table is turned over on its side. The kitchen chairs are in disarray. But the strangest sight is the dozens of tiny, white, fluffy things on the floor, counters, and furniture. She picks one up for a closer look and finds herself even more confused than before. It's a feather. They're all feathers. She calls her son's name again, praying for a response. This time, she receives one, though not the one she hopes for. She hears the sound of shuffling footsteps up above, followed by a strangled sound like a scream caught in someone's throat. She sprints up the stairs as fast as her legs can carry her, throwing open the door to her son's bedroom. There, she finds him. But this is not the bright-eyed boy that she left behind when she left for work. His arms are covered with a thick layer of white feathers, the same feathers that are beginning to poke through the skin of his face. The top of his head has elongated into a floppy comb of excess skin, the same sort of excess skin that is wobbling below his chin. And his mouth, it doesn't look like a mouth anymore. It's pointed and hard, and his lips click together when he speaks, or rather, clucks. His bare feet are scaly and red, with claws protruding from his toes. He flaps his wings frantically, eyes wide and wild, clucking and running back and forth across the room. When he looks at her, she does not see recognition in his gaze. Her son, her beloved boy, has turned into a chicken. Unable to do anything else, the mother calls an ambulance. At first, the paramedics that arrive on the scene think the call was some sort of elaborate prank, but when they set eyes on the boy, they agree that something truly bizarre is going on. They speed to the hospital with the chicken boy in tow, but sadly, are unable to save his life. The mother turns over the can of the mysterious soup to the authorities, who launch a formal investigation. Unfortunately, they are unable to trace the can to any store, 
nor are they able to verify the existence of the company name on its label. Employees of the grocery store where she found the can insist that they have never seen it in their lives. Several weeks after this incident occurred, the SCP Foundation conducted a raid on a New York office of Marshall, Carter, and Dark. For those of you unfamiliar with the organization, and that is most of the general population by design, Marshall, Carter, and Dark LTD is an extremely powerful multinational corporation founded by three individuals with those surnames, specializing in the acquisition and sale of anomalous items, entities, and experiences. To put it simply, they run the largest anomalous black market in the world and are the crime bosses of the paranormal world. During this particular raid, SCP Foundation operatives recovered 17 different unusual items. Among the items discovered was a shipping crate recently delivered by the Federal Postal Service from an invalid return address. This crate contained 103 cans of SCP-2057, as well as a copy of a letter written to one of the company's associates. So far, the letter has not been traced to an address. It reads, Dear Cyrus, Maria has told me of the unfortunate circumstances that have befallen your children. I had hoped to hear about the improvement of their condition soon. As their godfather, I am extremely distressed to hear this. Having experienced a child suffering from the measles myself, I know how terrifying it can be when it seems as if they are getting worse. Recently, we received a shipment of something that I hope can help your family. There is a crate in the storage area marked with Wondertainment, Discontinued Item. It will not be there long, as it goes to auction next week. I will leave a key under the photo of your family on your desk. Follow the instructions exactly. Do not, under any circumstances, do anything different than what is directed on the can. Destroy this message as soon as possible. I do not want any of this to come back on us. Be careful, my friend. Williams. SCP-2057 consists of 92 318 milliliter cans of condensed chicken noodle soup. Each can is covered with a brightly colored label depicting images of noodles, a cartoon chicken, and dancing vegetables. In addition to this inviting imagery, each label is emblazoned with the text, Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Each can has a pull-top lid for easy opening and is printed with a set of nutrition facts, ingredients, and instructions for heating. The nutrition facts are as follows. Calories, 95. Fat, 3.17 grams. Carbohydrates, 2.2 grams. Protein, 13.48 grams. Vitamin W, 2 grams. And Mother's Love, 10 grams. The SCP Foundation attempted to analyze the contents of the soup in order to compare it to the posted nutrition facts. The calories, fat, carbohydrates, and protein were found to be accurately reported. Vitamin W was present in the reported amount as well, though it was not a compound that the Foundation scientists had ever encountered before. Mother's love, as it is an intangible concept, was not able to be identified or measured in the analyzed soup samples. The ingredients are listed as ultralicious chicken stock, enriched Chinese egg noodles, finest cooked chicken breast, farm fresh carrots, crispy crunchy celery, sweet Vidalia onions, no paint thinner, fresh mountain spring water, vitamin W, contains less than 2% of the following ingredients. A pinch of salt, a smidgen of chicken fat, sprinkle of spice extracted from rare plants, a dash of high quality unicorn tears. The instructions for heating read, Hey kids, feeling sick, icky, or downright yucky? Just pop open a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids. Place contents of the can in a medium-sized soup pot. Add a can of water, stir, and heat. Watch as the fun begins. Eat hearty, and you'll feel better and ready to play with Dr. Wondertainment toys in no time. All of this is relatively straightforward, give or take a few unusual ingredients. Someone taking only a quick look might mistake a can of this soup for any other chicken noodle soup. However, it does have something that most ordinary canned soup does not. A warning label. Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids is intended to be eaten while it is hot to make you feel better in no time at all. Do not consume after it has become cold. Do not reheat. By purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment, you agree to not hold Dr. Wondertainment or any of Dr. Wondertainment's affiliates accountable for injuries or damages incurred by your product. Thank you for purchasing from Dr. Wondertainment. So what exactly is in a can of Dr. Wondertainment's Ultralicious Chicken Noodle Soup for Kids? Well, when the SCP Foundation first opened a can to take a look, they found that it was filled with condensed chicken broth and a mass of egg noodles shaped like an egg. 
When water was added and the contents of the can were heated to a temperature of 70 degrees Celsius, the noodle-based egg hatched. Inside was a small domesticated chicken made up of egg noodles, carrot, celery, onion, and cooked chicken breast. For simplicity's sake, this chicken noodle soup chicken is referred to as SCP-2057-1. As the Foundation researchers continued to heat the broth to a higher temperature, SCP-2057-1 began to move around, make audible chirping sounds, and eat the broth. As it ate, it grew larger and larger until it reached a mass of 85 grams and resembled a miniature adult chicken. At a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, SCP-2057-1 behaved much like an ordinary chicken. It continued to behave normally even as it was consumed or cut apart, apparently feeling no pain or awareness of its situation. Dissection of SCP-2057-1 revealed that its insides were made up of soup ingredients, including celery and onion bones, cooked chicken breast muscles, carrot beak and legs, and chicken broth blood. When SCP-2057-1's temperature dropped below 35 degrees Celsius, it stopped moving and collapsed into the soup. At a temperature below 20 degrees Celsius, it became congealed and unappetizing. With these observations completed, the Foundation then attempted to measure the effects of this unusual chicken soup on a person that ingested it. When test subjects were fed samples of the soup at a temperature between 35 and 70 degrees Celsius, they had a very positive experience. The soup's taste was described as excellent, delicious, and homey. Though the meal caused a bit of psychological distress due to the soup chicken's realistic appearance and behavior, it improved every test subject's physical well-being. This eventually applied to test subjects with a case of influenza, measles, or the common cold. Following consumption of SCP-2057, each subject with a diagnosed illness of this kind reported immediate relief from their symptoms, including fever, aches and pains, cough, and congestion. With this positive, if a bit disturbing, effect documented, the Foundation next set out to determine what would happen if they let the soup get cold before it was eaten. Test subjects served this version of the soup had a far worse experience, describing the taste of their meal as bland, disgusting, and repulsive. 67% of the test subjects experienced cramps, chills, and diarrhea following their consumption of the soup, and 62% found themselves making involuntary clucking noises, as well as experiencing a strong aversion to poultry products. Again, several test subjects were deliberately selected based on their cases of influenza, measles, and the common cold. These test subjects immediately began to develop troubling symptoms, including the growth of pin feathers on their forearms, loosened excess skin on their heads and under their chins, a change in their ability to walk normally, and distressing hallucinations of being hung upside down by the ankles. Following these two rounds of testing, the research team decided to see why exactly the warning label advised against reheating the soup. D-Class 45782 was selected as the test subject for this particular experiment and was instructed to reheat a bowl of cooled SCP-2057-1 in a microwave on high for 2 minutes and 30 seconds. Then, he was to consume the reheated soup and report his experience to a camera placed in the room with him. As instructed, D-45782 microwaved the bowl of soup. As it heated in the microwave, it emitted unintelligible vocalizations in a deep voice. After removing the bowl from the microwave, D-45782 noted that it was gelatinous-looking, with blackened burnt bits around the edges. He took three bites of the disgusting, hot and cold at the same time mixture before spitting it out onto the floor and refusing to eat another bite. Fifteen minutes after tasting the reheated soup, D-45872 began to exhibit significant distress, plucking angrily into the camera. Five minutes later, D-45872 became more difficult to understand clucks and other chicken-like vocalizations, making up most of his attempted speech. He began scratching vigorously at his arms to the point of drawing blood. Loose skin could be seen gathering on the top of his head and under his neck. Six minutes later, D-45872 had lost the ability to speak. Large white pin feathers had sprouted from his arms, covering the skin, and smaller white feathers were beginning to sprout from his face. After 16 more minutes passed, D-45872 began attacking other objects in the room, attempting to destroy the microwave, knocking the bowl of soup to the floor, and flipping over a table and chair. He had grown feathers over 67% of his skin, and his face had begun to change drastically. His nasal area was elongated and hardened, joining with his lower jaw in an appendage resembling a bird's beak. His upper lip had disappeared into his nasal cavity, 
Only five minutes later, D-45872 suddenly stopped moving and collapsed to the floor, dead. Following D-45872's death, an autopsy was performed. These were the findings. Autopsy revealed D-45782's cause of death was due to extreme and sudden physical change of internal organs, resulting in shock and cardiac arrest. 93% of the subject's skin was covered in feathers. Physical changes in the face resulted in a beak-like alteration of the nose and mouth. Loose skin under the neck and on the top of the head resemble a waddle and comb. Subject's lower legs were found to be covered in thick, scaly skin, with the toes of the subject's feet ending in small, rounded claws. The subject and instance of SCP-2057-1 were incinerated after testing and autopsy. Whenever not being used for approved experimentation, all cans of SCP-2057 must be stored in a standard, large-volume storage locker in Containment Area 27 and kept at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Because SCP-2057 is in limited supply, all experiments must first be approved by at least two personnel with 2-1103 clearance, as well as receiving the go-ahead from Dr. Applegate. There are still 41 cans of Dr. Wondertainment's chicken soup unaccounted for, and the Foundation has been unable to track them down so far. Who knows where they ended up? Maybe at another office of Marshall Carter and Dark. Or maybe, just maybe, one made its way onto the shelves at your local grocery store. Best to be careful out there. When you're feeling sick, hungry, or in need of a little pick-me-up, there's nothing quite like a steaming hot bowl of chicken noodle soup. Just make sure to read the label carefully and always follow the printed instructions. If you ignore them, you might just find that your chickens have come home to roost. After all, as the saying goes, you are what you eat. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1550, Dr. Wondertainment's Custom Pets.